All of our council members are here now. Good afternoon. Welcome to our 1 p.m. session of the November 9th, 2021 meeting of the city council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you're wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Watkins. Here. Helen Tari Johnson. Here. Brown. Here. Coming. Here. Holder. Here. Vice Mayor Bruner. Present. And Mayor Myers. Present. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an item, an agenda item that will be open for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers eight through 12, excuse me, eight through 32 on our agenda with the exception of item number 27, which has been removed. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Seeing no hands, I will go ahead and ask our city clerk to announce any additions or deletions to the agenda today. Thank you, Mayor. With, um, you already mentioned it, item 27 has been removed. Other than that, that there's not. Thank you. I'd like to make an announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda today. Oral communications will occur immediately after agenda item number 32. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item number 32. I'd now like to ask um, our city attorney to provide a report on closed session, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Myers, members of the city council. Um, I have a couple items to report today. Um, this morning, the council met in closed session to discuss the following uh, items. Item one was uh, public employment, uh, and specifically uh, the council considered the city manager position in closed session. Uh, there's also an item on your afternoon agenda relating to that. Item two, bear with me while I open the correct page. Item two was a conference with labor negotiators and the council received a report from its negotiator and uh, with regard to service employees, uh, SEIU service employees, council received a report from its uh, labor negotiator on that item. Item three was a matter of existing litigation uh, involving the county of Santa Cruz et al versus Purdue Pharma et al. And with respect, to that item, the council um, unanimously adopted a motion um, directing the city manager to sign all necessary documents required to join a settlement agreement with opioid distributors McKesson, Cardinal Health, 
uh, Amerisource Bergen and manufacturer Janssen Pharmaceuticals Inc. A settlement agreement has been proposed for that item and as soon as that is executed, it will be available for inspection uh, upon request by members of the public. Item four was an item of significant exposure to litigation. Council received a report from the city attorney uh, and that item will also be continued uh, at the end of your open session for further discussion this evening. Item five was a conference with legal counsel involving anticipated litigation, uh, considering initiation of litigation and one potential item, uh, one potential case was discussed. Uh, there was no other reportable action. Thank you, Mr. Condotti. We'll now go into item number six on our agenda, which is the city manager's report. Rosary Menard, our interim city manager is here. Good afternoon, mayor and council members. Um, so we're gonna give you a quick overview of several things today. One is an item, an update on COVID. We haven't had that on the, um, on the agenda for a little bit. So we'll have that and then uh, Lee Butler, our uh, deputy city manager and, um, and uh, you know, homelessness response manager, in addition to the uh, planning community development director, will be giving you a quick update on homelessness. And I do want to mention that there was a um, an FYI was uh, distributed this morning. It will be posted, so it will be available publicly. But I wanted to have you um, have that. He's going to give you a quick overview of that. And then I just have a few slides about upcoming events, and um, we'll close with that. So with that, um, Chief Bodhi. Yes, thank you, Mayor Myers and Vice Mayor Brunner. Um, I'll be short and sweet. Um, just gonna wanna give you guys an update for the, uh, the COVID pandemic for November 9th. Um, currently, uh, everything is you know optimistic in terms of um, in the last 14 days, we've seen a 15% decrease in the number of um, cases. Although with that in mind, the California Department of Public Health does warn that due to the holiday and the colder climate, um, they are sort of concerned about a, uh, a bump, if you will, in terms of number of cases. Um, transmissibility is still substantial. Um, in this county, 60% uh, of it is due to community spread. So while you're out and about, <clears throat> um, second only to household transmission, uh, people bringing it back home to um, their families. Um, I think it's important to note that Monterey County has reinstituted their indoor mask mandate. Um, with that in mind, uh, masking indoors is still strongly recommended by the health uh, director of Santa Cruz County. Um, in terms of vaccines, um, we are currently at 398,620 doses administered. Um, so currently we're at 72% of the population has had at least one dose. Um, and in terms of full vaccination, we're at 67%. So in context, the state is currently at 73.5%. Uh, so we still have some work to do as a county. Um, and again, I wanna put it out there that um, appointments for vaccinations, both initial and boosters are at myturn.ca.gov. Um, in terms of children, um, the Pfizer vaccine has been approved and is rolling out for five-year-olds to 11-year-olds. Um, they are currently taking walk-ins and appointments um, as of last week. Um, the Santa Cruz County Office of Education um, has implemented this plan uh, as of yesterday, um, November 8th. Um, for those that are wondering, it's one third the adult dose. It's two shots, three weeks apart, and it is extremely effective. Um, and then for those that are under uh, five years, six months to four years, they're expecting to have some sort of approval uh, in early 2022. Next slide. Um, here's a quick snapshot of the Delta surge, if you will. So like you, you can see up in the upper right-hand corner, it's from July 1st to uh, November 5th. And it sort of shows you that we are currently like leveling off in terms of number of cases but I think the most important part of this slide is on the right side, if you see uh, person to person community acquired is still 60% uh, of the uh, uh, current transmission, uh, only second to only the uh, person to person in the household. 
Next slide. Um, we are currently seeing a significant decrease. Um, although I have to be honest, um, the last couple of weeks, it's been you know in the 30 to 25% range. And now we're sort of leveling off at a 15% decrease in the 14 day change in terms of number of cases. Um, and as you can see, the preliminary data uh, indicated by the triangles um, indicates that we might see some changes that are less than um, desirable. So next slide. Um, but we currently, as you can see here in terms of transmissibility in Santa Cruz County, uh, the um, we're well below the one, the number one in terms of um, uh, um, transmissibility. So we currently are on a good trend and can hopefully can continue that uh, path moving forward. Next slide. And in terms of vaccinations, um, I think it is important to note that currently um, at least 72% of the county population has at least one dose. Um, in terms of complete uh, vaccination, uh, fully vaccinated in the county, we're at 67%. Again, in contrast to the state, which is at 73.5, we still have some work to do. Um, and I think we're gonna see some significant increase in terms of vaccinations once um, children uh, between five and 11 are uh, uh, vaccinated. Next slide. Um, and then um, just to sort of uh, push the booster doses, again, um, if you are someone who is 65 or older, um, or you have underlying medical conditions, um, it is advisable that you get a booster shot um, for the uh, vaccines that are currently available. All three um, are currently available in terms of boosters, Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J. &J. Um, Pfizer and Moderna are recommending that after six months, uh, after your second dose, you get a uh, booster, um, as opposed to the J&J, &J, which is two months after the first dose, you need to get a, um, a booster. So something that I wanna push out there, because I think the only way we're gonna turn the corner is by getting vaccinations, and of course, um, getting the boosters as needed. And so in order to do that, um, I say go to myturn.ca.gov to locate and schedule initial vaccine and boosters as needed. Next slide. And of course, for any additional information that you may need, um, go to santacruzhealth.org um, to get um, additional information and in, uh, up to date in terms of COVID and vaccinations that are available um, in town. That's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chief Odie. Is there any questions from council members? Okay, Director Butler. Thank you, Rosemary, and good afternoon, Mayor and council members. Um, as Rosemary mentioned, we did uh, provide the council members today with an FYI memo that will also be posted on our website. Wanted to take this opportunity to just quickly go through that with you. Some of it contains information that you are already aware of, like the county continuing its operations up at the armory through the end of the fiscal year, and therefore the need for us to readjust our approach on the um, safe sleeping program that we were planning up there, but it also contains some additional information regarding um, our approach to various um, directives that we have from the council. The memo outlines um, four different um, safe sleeping and or 24 seven um, programs that we would have. Um, one at the um, armory, one at the uh, 1220 River uh, site that the city owns, um, another at the Benchland, Benchlands, which is currently existing, and then um, a fourth at a yet to be determined location. Um, it also identifies um, the costs, uh, estimated costs associated with those, as well as um, estimated costs for a RV safe parking program in each of the three tiers that um, the council is contemplating as part of the, um, the prior consideration of the oversized vehicle ordinance and the um, same uh, item that's on your agenda this afternoon. 
Um, and finally, it talks about some additional costs with respect to um, potential services like a dump station, an RV dump station or mobile service. And so um, all of that is uh, in the memo and feel free to reach out to myself if you have any questions about that. And we will be bringing additional information back at uh, future council meetings related to um, the next steps associated with uh, the items identified in the FYI memo. The last thing I wanted to point out on um, the homelessness front is that um, with respect to the $14 million that the, the state has authorized, we have uh, initiated a process with the county. And um, many of you will recall uh, Dave Seppos with um, the Sacramento State um, Consensus and Collaboration Program. Um, he is working with us to go through a uh, process with the county to help uh, make sure that we're aligning those resources in a manner that um, meets our long-term objectives and not just our objectives, but also those of the county to try and get those resources pointed um, to where they are um, supporting the long-term efforts of multiple organizations. Um, as part of that, we're also going to be looking at how that may also be used to um, inform our regular interactions and how we can improve our collaboration and coordination and communication. So we're happy to have Dave on board for that. And um, we are um, looking forward to working with the county on, on getting those uh, dollars put to good use. And I'm available for any questions that the council may have. Uh, council member Palantari Johnson and council member Cummings. Thank you so much for the memo. Uh, I wanted for the public for it to be clear that the 24 seven transitional shelter that um, you've identified in the memo um, is part of the CSSO and is part of the safe is instead of the safe sleeping. Is that correct? Director Butler. Yeah, so, so we're looking at um, how we might incorporate 24-7 uh, camps in lieu of some of the, um, the overnight only. Mm -hmm. And um, that, can, um, uh, that can result in, in better outcomes. Um, and, and so we're looking at, at that and we wanted to put that out there um, to, to let the council know as well as the community know that um, we're contemplating that approach at this point. That's great. I really, really appreciate um, your work and staff's work on that because that is something that we heard as a concern um, from the community and from folks in the public health world. Um, and I also just want to point out that um, for members of the community who are concerned that nothing is happening around service provision and standing up services, that there is actually a lot happening and taking place from behind the scenes. So I want to acknowledge you, Director Butler, and the rest of the team. And um, just I appreciate all the work that you're doing to stand up these services that are really, really much needed in our community. Thank you. The, the one thing I would add um, there is that, you know, we'll also be coordinating with people in the surrounding areas. So, you know, uh, we haven't done some of that outreach yet that um, uh, we want to do, um, you know, 1220 River comes to mind, you know, that while there was a program there before, um, we will be reaching out to folks in the uh, immediately surrounding area to, to talk with them to understand um, the concerns they, they have and to um, try to build in um, uh, provisions to help address those concerns. Great. Thank you. I look forward to hearing more um, next time you guys bring this to the council. Uh, council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. I had a question, um, and I brought this up with the interim city manager the other day, but Lee, since you uh, were mentioning the $14 million now, I thought maybe that this would be a good time to ask this question. So um, will there be a time or an opportunity for the public to weigh in on how this funding should be spent prior to um, you know, the city and county kind of making a formalized agreement? Because it seems like um, there's, you know, obviously we want to, you know, invest in infrastructure. I think that's a good kind of route to take with the funding. And I think that that was part of the, um, you know, the, the rationale for getting the funding brought to the city of Santa Cruz to help us with our infrastructure needs. But I'm wondering if um, there might be an opportunity for 
folks from the city, from the public and members of the council to weigh in on this prior to, um, you know, agreements being made between the city and the county? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so I, uh, I'm from a company that I did discuss this and I would be happy to bring back an agenda item um, to sort of talk about sort of the general approach we're considering. Um, I think a number of us really do want to sort of tee up the, the funding question and where that money is going to go kind of as the initial thing so that we can get some of it, some of it being put to work. And uh, so I think that probably for something like the December 14th agenda, I could put something on that would allow for us to have a, have a discussion about what we're considering and, uh, and you know, the ideas of, that are behind that. So I'd be happy to do that. Great. Thanks. And I think a lot of members of the public would just appreciate the transparency and opportunity to hear about this. So thank you. I have a quick question, Lee, if you could um, maybe just <coughs> make a couple of additional comments. Um, there is a lot of frustration um, about the conditions um, and not kind of moving forward with some of the, some of the, hopefully, you know, what we were hoping in terms of um, finding some stability for folks, um, especially over there on the bench lands. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, sort of you reformatted a little bit in looking at a 24-7 camp, and you mentioned because of better outcomes. And can you maybe explain to the public what, what you mean by better outcomes? Because I think we've learned quite a bit, the county's learned quite a bit about placing folks from the um, previously uh, supported um, hotels due to the COVID situation as they've gone through their um the you know project rehome i think there's there's some learning going on and so i think maybe we're being influenced a little bit by some of those findings could you maybe expand on those a little bit sure so um the county has been um in the midst of a rehousing wave um that they have targeted at um the individuals that they have had in the um the hotels primarily and um, and both in through that program as well as through um, other service provider experiences, the the stability um, and the the stabilizing effect of the twenty four seven programs um, has um, established has proven in many instances to um, uh, help move people along into more permanently housed situations. Um, in in a manner that um, is oftentimes um, better than than just the um, the overnight only programs. You know there are certainly exceptions to you know certain programs, but um, in general that's been the finding. And so that's one of the things that um, we have been taking into consideration um, as we've been um, consulting with. Um, uh, nonprofits like Focus Strategies, who does uh, work um, throughout the United States, and in our conversations with the the county and, and learning from their experiences, as you noted, Mayor Myers. And do the do these do these shelters the twenty four seven encampment? What I would call sort of a temp, which basically is kind of filling the role of a shelter in many ways. Um, I would understand that those are probably much more expensive to run than a safe than an overnight sleeping site. Is that right? They can be. Um, there is additional staffing involved. Um, it's it's interesting that um, one of the things that we heard from um, some service providers was that um, there sometimes needs to be more staffing for an overnight program um, because that the the community hasn't been established. You know, there, there, um, it, it, there isn't that level of trust among participants. Um, so there might be more staff, but they're for a shorter period of time. So, um, you know, that daytime staffing isn't provided um, and that, that is more expensive. Um, that it, so the 24 seven programs are more expensive. And um, one of the things that we're taking into account is, is those outcomes, if, if we can, actually have better outcomes that are moving people into housing, then um, those expenses could um, be better off in the long run. 
Hey, can, can those, can can those they, go ahead, Rosemary. Could I just add a comment to that? Uh, we did, I think the, the FYI memo that was distributed does sort of show you what the differential is. It is, it is more expensive to run the 24 seven, but not dramatically. So, so I think that's really the takeaway. And, but the 24 seven could be um, facilitated as a place where people um, are provided shelter, but also are managed, you know, have a case manager, have the ability to access housing. So, you know, one of the diagnoses that shows up in the focus strategies work for the county is, is that we just aren't, we don't, we don't, people are not leaving, right? I mean, so we're not, we're not making that next connection in their in their ability to, you know, to um, move out of homelessness. And so they're ending, ending up staying in shelters and encampments for a long, long time. Would we operate this sort of in the vein of trying to, you know, move people through um, into transitional and then permanent and then, you know, on and on in terms of that housing goal that the, that the county, you know, has basically set. So would we be mirroring their goals, I guess, by establishing these kinds of facilities? Um, I would say in general, yes. Um, the, the county has um, some very specific timelines that they have identified for um, their goals with respect to shelter stays and um, percentages of placements. I can't say that, you know, we're going to have those exact same numbers in terms of um, percentage of permanent housing placements and um, timelines for um, the maximum length of stay or average length of stay. Um, that said, um, at, at the basic level, yes, we want to work with both the county as well as um, what we have included in this FYI memo is um, having um, some level of, of case management support that the city also provides to help connect people to many of those county resources and help them move from these locations into um, more permanent housing situations. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important that, you know, the goal of the Camping Standards Ordinance, you know, really recognizes the, the larger public need to be able to access parks and, you know, places that are really truly meant to be for the public um, and not, you know, becoming so, I, I just worry a little bit that, you know, we're gonna continue to, you know, fall into the into the cycle of not really having any ability to help people get into, you know, I, I just, I'm a little worried that we're gonna be setting up things that again, we're, we're not getting what we need in terms of sort of a systematic approach to helping people out of homelessness and then, but also providing additional places for people to be so we don't have, you know, our parks being used, um, frankly, you know, I mean, that is something that came through very clear as we developed the Camping and Standards Ordinance. So um, I'm, I'm glad that we're moving towards something, but I, I really hope we can keep in mind that we do need additional places to, for people to go so that our public spaces don't become our impromptu shelters again or places for people to be. Um, so I'm supportive of, but I just hope we really, you know, we put all the pieces together. Do we have any um, updates from the county on the 120 spaces they committed to finding last March? Is there any spaces that have been found in the county at all for helping with our uh, needs? I can say that um, the, the county is pursuing a number of um, project home key applications and the, the city has had um, one conversation with um, uh, H, the housing and community development at the state regarding um, Project Home Key and has another one scheduled. Um, and so they are um, pursuing through um, Project Home Key some other options. Um, you know, where those ultimately end up, um, we'll see because um, some of that is, is competitive. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sorry for all the questions. <laughs> More, uh, Rosemary, do you have additional items? I said one comment. Oh, was, sorry, go ahead, Justin. Yeah, I just wanted to um, express appreciation for the potential 24 seven um, shelter models, just because uh, there are, you know, 
for people who are homeless and trying to find whatever jobs they can get. There are people who work night shifts, and those people need places to stay as well. So if we're if we only have overnight sleeping, you know that also um, kind of prevents having some kind of sleeping areas for people who may you know need to sleep during the day. And so I appreciate moving in that direction because it might be that you know we can work with some local businesses that operate during the evenings to try to find people job placement, and that can be in somewhere where they could find shelter when they're working night shifts as well. So just thought I'd put that out there and express my appreciation because it can help support that demographic of our homeless population as well. Thank you, council member. Okay, just a few uh, slides. I'm gonna share my screen now um, to talk about a few things that are going on. This is a, in the ramp up to the holiday period. We have a ton of things going on that I just wanted to give the uh, council members a, um, you know, a chance to sort of see and also sort of talk to the community about. So on uh, downtown plan expansion, we are seeing a number of uh, community workshops are scheduled starting this weekend. Um, and there's a community survey that's out. There's idea walls, places that you can post comments or join an existing discussion and interactive maps. So the link to that is here at cityofsantacruz.com backslash downtown. And so we're encouraging taking lots of input on this topic and encouraging everyone to um, get involved. And then on objective standards, that process has, uh, there was a robust conversation at the planning commission uh, last uh, Thursday. And so if you have information that you would like to um, review with the existing proposed objective standards or give feedback, um, and there's a virtual community meeting tonight uh, on that. So make yourself, if you're interested in this topic, that's where to go. Um, library mixed use projects. A number of um, meetings were held last week and workshops will be upcoming in December to, resume, to review the design concepts with the community. So stay tuned for that. Lots of stuff going on. I'm sure there's a website uh, on this one to, that you can sort of get some feedback on what's been going on there. Um, and then uh, the, later on in today's agenda is an item, a resolution uh, related to anti-hate week that's happening next week actually. So this is a series of events that are United Against Hate Week events. And you can see that there's a, quite a bit of information here and you'll be able to access uh, all of these through the QR code here or uh, I'm sure there's websites, uh, United Against Hate uh, Week website. And uh, just a heads up, we've got uh, heading into the holiday season, there are a series of uh, city office closures on Thursday for close for Veterans Day, uh, Thanksgiving closed for the November 25th and 26th. And then the winter closure um, is the 20th to the 31st where the offices are closed, but essential services will continue. So. Um, just giving the community a heads up on those things. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, maybe one other additional announcement is I believe we will be going back into a, we'll be going to a hybrid um, right. council, um, city council meeting starting on November 23rd. Right. So uh, we will be back in city hall. And we will also be broadcasting or not broadcasting. We will also be having a hybrid with a Zoom. Um, so those folks who were interested in um, getting back into person, um, you will find a very uh, different looking city hall when you walk into the council chambers, but um, we will be uh, able to go back in person um, there at, at the uh, city hall chamber, at the county council chambers starting November 23rd. Um, if you do want to come to the council chambers, uh, I know there'll be information that will be made available regard, regarding requirements for masks and demonstration of vaccination, limitations on the number of people who are in the chambers, you know, can be in the chambers, a waiting room over in Tony Hill room. So there's a series of things. Please, if you want to come down to the council chambers, please take a minute or two to go online and, and take a look at that. We'll be highlighting that on our website so you can get all the details before you get here. 
Will that information also maybe be posted outside uh, council chambers early on, uh, Rosemary? Yes. If people don't have computers, they can walk by and check it out. Yes. Can that be printed in uh, Spanish also, potentially? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. And that's it okay. for the city manager's report. Any other questions for the city manager today? Not seeing any. Okay, we'll go ahead and I'll call now on the clerk to provide any updates to our calendar. Um, there are not. Thank you, Bonnie. Next up is our uh, consent agenda, and these are items 8 through 20 on our agenda today for members of the public who are streaming. Oh, my video went off. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, and now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 8 through 20. Instructions will be on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand and listen to the queue saying you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who want to uh, comment on or pull any items? Please raise your hand. Council member Cummings. Questions for 17 and 18. Okay. Okay, any other council members with uh, a comment or question on our item or a request to pull an item? Okay, I'm not seeing any additional hands. So we don't have any items pulled today. Uh, I'll go ahead on and uh, have council member Cummings uh, ask his questions on uh, item number 17 first. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just had a question that came um, from a member of the public. Um, they were asking about the status of the vegetation and the arts plan that are associated with uh, the rail trail segments and kind of what what the status is, like where they're at and, and kind of what's the plan for moving those pieces forward. Good afternoon, uh, Nathan Nguyen, uh, Transportation Manager for the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, happy to answer your question there, Justin. Um, <clears throat> so the rail trail uh, vegetation plan as part of uh, the rail trail segment seven phase one, uh, Parks and Rex is assisting us, or assisting the city here in uh, revamping the uh, vegetation that was um, installed earlier this year. Um, by the time segment seven phase one was constructed, it was spring, and so some of the hydro seeding and plantings, you know, didn't quite stick. So um, Parks and Rec is going to give it another shot uh, this upcoming winter, and they should be hydro seeding along uh, the rail trail uh, end of this month. Um, when it comes to the arts uh, portion of the rail trail, um, we're still having a tough time getting a contractor to come in and install the poetry that was a part of segment seven phase one. Uh, economic development is the lead on that and, and uh, we're trying to assist and get a contractor on board for a reasonable price to get that completed. Uh, in addition to that, we also have um, uh, art scheduled for the um, bollards on Palm Street. So it's mosaic tiles too that um, I believe that again, economic development is gonna be reaching out to get an artist on board uh, and, and, and getting um, uh, art installed as planned um, as on that segment. I see Bonnie Lipscomb has turned on her camera. I don't know if she has anything to add on those questions. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I would just add um, to what Nathan Nathan said is that we, we are hoping that um, some of our card, that's the City Arts Recovery Design uh, Pilot Grant Program applicants may be um, able to actually work on the mosaics um, on the for the bollards. And so we've been, um, Kathy Mentz, um, who's been working um, on that with um, applicants, um, has been working on that and specifically also, um, in addition to those projects, um, there are also two card applicants working on proposals for installations on the rail trail itself. So we are um, working to to move that forward, and um, it's a little behind the scenes at this point, but it is it, it is being worked on. And just a, a quick follow up: Has there been any um, just mention of this to the Arts Commission to see if they might be able to help identify um, artists who could help with some of these efforts? I know that uh, Kathy is in regular communication with the Arts Commission um, and specifically around all the opportunities around the CARD program, the CARD pilot program. So, uh, you know, I don't have confirmation exactly as it relates to the rail trail, but I can circle back with that specific information. Okay. 
That concludes my questions on this item. Thank you, council member. Uh, item number 18. Yeah, so um, again, received some correspondence from members of from a member of the public, and um, with regards to the fiscal impact, um, they were wondering if this was the cost of the final design or the total overall cost for the design. And I was wondering if uh, staff might be able to provide a comment on that. Uh, certainly, uh, I have to have to apologize. My my camera ceased functioning this morning, so uh, I just have my name up there. Uh, this is Josh Spanger, Mayor, Member City Council, Senior Civil Engineer uh, with Public Works. This is uh, regarding amendment number, I believe, nine for the design contract for the Murray Street Bridge. Uh, the design is essentially complete. So uh, what, what this amendment is about is getting the utility agreements in place and final coordination with uh, various utilities, including the County Sanitation District. Uh, and that coordination facilitated a fairly major uh, revision in the design. Um, so I, I don't know how specifically you want to define design. I mean, the design is essentially done, but we're just trying to get through the last administrative hoops with Caltrans as far as uh, getting the funds available and, and moving uh, phasing around and getting these uh, utility agreements in place. Once we have the utility agreements in place, we'll have a right-of-way certification, which will essentially allow us to request funds for construction from Caltrans. Uh, so we're pretty close to the end of this, this whole thing right now. It's just, um, if there are any additional amendments to this contract, they would be along the lines of providing additional information for regulatory agencies, for example, or construction support once you actually go into construction but the design is, is really, um, it's, it's done and it's been done for some time now. Thanks, yeah, I think the, what the concern was from one of the members of the public was whether or not there were any other costs that came up around the design earlier on that maybe weren't captured in that $459,959. And so that was really what I was trying to, to get at is just to know whether or not um, this was the total cost for that, you know, the design phase, um, or if this was just the final cost for the final design. So, um, yeah, we, I, I, I don't expect that we would see any more amendments during the design phase. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, council member. Okay, um, I'll now take this out to public comment. So this will be from for um, our consent agenda today. And if there are any members of the public that would like to speak to any item on our consent agenda, uh, we have not had any items pulled today. Now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and then the timer will be set to two minutes. And again, this will be for items on our consent agenda, agenda today, which are items eight through 20. Uh, council has not pulled any items today from this consent agenda. Uh, agenda. Take a peek at our ag attendees today. If you do want to speak to any of these items, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And I am not seeing anyone with their hand up on these items. Uh, so I will go ahead and look for um, a motion for our consent agenda today. Council Member Watkins and then Council Member Brown. Sure, I'm happy to make a motion to move our consent agenda. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a uh, motion by Council Member Watkins and a second by Council Member Brown to move our entire um, consent agenda this, this afternoon, and that is going to be items number uh, 8 through 20. And Bonnie, could we do a roll call vote, please? Council Watkins? Aye. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Um, Brown? Aye. Tummy? Aye. Boulder? Council member Boulder? Boulder? You're off for camera. Oh. Um, Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. 
me just see if he's having problems here. Hang on one sec. Let me just see if I can reach her. I don't know if she's having internet issues. Turned off her. Uh... Okay, I guess we'll go ahead with that that vote. And my vote is a is a aye. Also, I'll try to see if she's having issues. Um, okay, uh, that uh, motion passes unanimously. We'll now move into our. It, uh, just to clarify, it's not unanimous. We don't have. Oh, I'm orders, sorry. Yeah, so. yeah. Sorry. Uh, that motion passes um, six in favor. Uh, with Council Member Boulder being absent. And the vote. Okay, we'll now move into the consent public hearing um, items today, and this will be items number 21, 22, and 23 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment on items <coughs> 21, 22, or 23, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. All items will be at pa- acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any items on the consent public hearing today? Council member Cummings and then council member Bruner. I'd like to pull items numbers 21 and 23. And Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. I I was going to, um, I just had a question slash comment for item 23. Okay, that item will be pulled today so we can have that, those, we can do those comments slash questions during that item. Okay, for members of the public who are listening, um, there have been two items pulled from our consent public hearing. That's item number 21 and item number 23. Uh, So we will go ahead and um, let me look here. Hang on, let me catch up with my stuff there. Um, If there are members of the public that would like to speak to any public consent public hearing item, with the exception of item number 21 and 23, which have been pulled by council members, now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be um, set to one minute. So we will not be, um, so this will be, let me see here. This is just for item number 22 on our agenda, which is the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 21-19, amending the Santa Cruz Municipal Code chapter 6.12 to comply with state mandated organic waste disposal requirements. So that is the only item that still remains on our consent public hearing. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak to this item? Make a public comment on this item. Okay, seeing none, I will go ahead and bring this back to council and I look for a motion um, for item number 22 on our consent public hearing. Council member Cummings? I'll move item number 22. And I'll second that. Uh, So why don't we go ahead and go with a roll call vote? Council member Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Coming? Aye. Councilmember Golder is still absent. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Uh, that motion passes six in favor, zero against, with uh, Council Member Boulder absent, currently absent. Okay, uh, we will now move on to item number 21, which has been pulled by Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. I was, um, so this item 
um, on our agenda is the 2020-2021 Bud Action Plan Second Amendment for CDBG funding allocation. And one of the things that stood out in this item, um, which uh, I had heard some concern from members of the public on, was the um, the funding for the hygiene bay and how that's being uh, shifted. And one of the things I've heard as well is that we're spent, you know, there's a considerable amount of money being spent on the um, kind of temporary showers that are being used in that location. And one of the things I would like to recommend as part of our discussion, since we're going to have the discussion about the 14 million and a lot of that goes towards infrastructure, we'll be recommending that we um, have the consideration of funding for the hygiene bay renovation um, be considered as part of that discussion. So, I mean, I know this is a, a major infrastructure project that the city had committed itself to. And um, I think that at a minimum, you know, if we're going to discuss how the 14 million should be allocated, that we include this as part of that discussion. Councilmember Brown, did you have a comment on that? Uh, I, I just wanted to make a quick comment that I, I support that consideration. Uh, as a member of the Community Programs Committee, we received this request from Housing Matters um, several years ago, and um, in the process of um, getting uh, funding headed their way, you know, obviously we, you know, they had a lot of costs as a result of that to use the temporary facilities, um, the mobile showers, and that's a continued cost for Housing Matters. It's not inconsequential. And, um, you know, we're going to end up spending a lot more money in the long run if this isn't, um, you know, if we don't identify funding to um, get those shower bays uh, up and um, renovated. And as we see, the cost has increased substantially. And so the longer we go, um, you know, with this, the, the more money we're spending that um, is then not available to actually make the, the repair and the renovation that's needed for the longer term. So I, I do think that it's important that we um, just acknowledge that. Um, I support the making the change under the circumstances at this time and, and just want to make sure that we don't um, kind of spend another multiple years trying to figure out what to do about this. Um, because I think we were committed to um, that providing that support. It is a city property. So just wanted to add my support. And I would maybe look to city manager or um, someone with um, uh, economic development for any further updates or clarifications on the proposal for that. Um, I don't know, Rosemary, so you turn on your camera. I think Lee is, um, has got some basic background. I know this is in discussion. So let's start with let's start with Lee and then see if there's um, if Bonnie has anything else to add. Thanks and good afternoon again, Mayor and Council members. Yes, um, we are looking one to continue some level of CDBG funding um, for the hygiene bay. Um, and um, even if we took all the CDBG funding that we have available, it wouldn't um, get us to the point where we could fund the um, current cost estimate for the um, hygiene bay. But it is something that we also see as a priority. And um, that's one of the things that we're, we're hoping um, that we can um, get alignment with the county on to, to support because that is an integral part of the services that are provided out there at the Housing Matters campus. And um, when I, I say getting alignment on with and getting the additional funding, the 14 million is um, you know a prime candidate for that. But we are, as I mentioned before, going through that uh, collaborative process with the county. And um, I will also say that um, given the, um, the change in um, costs and scope, of the hygiene bay. Um, we are also, Public Works is in the process of um, preparing documentation for uh, a formal bid. Um, so um, the, the wheels are moving and uh, we do still need to confirm that funding. Um, and so I appreciate those comments and that's um, sort of uh, in alignment with the, the direction we're hoping to head as well. So, um, 
Council Member Cummings, are you comfortable with the motion that was drafted for this item now that there's a little more information? I didn't have any cons um, concern with the uh, recommended motion. I just wanted to add that um, when we have that discussion that we also include on the 14th about the 14 million that we include the hygiene bay as part of that. So um, that's the only change to the motion, the, to the recommendation before us. Okay. okay. Any other questions from other council members on item number 21 on the consent bulletin? Okay. I would look for a motion then oh. on this item. Yeah. Public comment. Oh, excuse me, I gotta go out to public comment, yep. So I'll go ahead and take this out for public comment. This is gonna be on item number 21 on the consent public hearing. If you are interested in commenting on this item, please press star nine on your phone now to raise your hand. And I am not seeing any hands going up. So uh, I will go ahead and take this back to council for a motion and a vote. Uh, council member Brown. Thank you. I will go ahead and, and move uh, adoption of the resolution amending our fiscal year 2022 to budget to reallocate CDBG funds to the fiscal year 2022 budget. 2022 budget. Uh, and the staff report as it's listed in the agenda and the rest of the staff report. Thank you, council member. Council member Cummings. I'll second with the amendment that we um, discussed as part of the item on December 14th, uh, the hygiene bay renovation. Can you specify what that amendment is for the minute? Sure, the amendment is uh, to add to the discussion regarding the $14 million on December 14th, funding the, re the renovation of the hygiene bay and housing matters. Does the maker of the motion accept that amendment? Yeah, it, I, I just want to clarify, that's the, the discussion about funding homelessness response and services in general, including the $14 million. So, yes. City manager? Yeah, I was just going to say that the presentation is sort of about the process that I'm imagining just about the process we're working on with the county. Um, it, that will be the core of it. We'll see where what else gets wrapped around it. But yeah, that's fine. We can we can talk about this until we get there. Great. Okay. Yes, I'm I'm on board. Thanks. Okay. okay let's go with the roll call vote. Bonnie. Council Member Watkins. Aye. Valentari Johnson. Aye. Brown. Aye. Cum Cummings. Aye. Holder. Bill Abstin, Vice Mayor Bruner. Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes 6-0 with uh, Council Member Golder uh, currently absent. Um, okay, we will move to item number 23, which was pulled by Council Member Cummings. Um, I just had a few comments on this and um, <laughs> given that um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion around this item, I just wanted to say my final comments. Um, there were members of the public who reached out and, and one of the things, oh, there was a number of things that they wanted to have expressed at the meeting. Um, one was that the it sound, the intent of this ordinance um, is meant to help individuals experiencing homelessness who are living in their RVs and they had expressed that um, having the enforcement tied to services would be beneficial because it's currently not. Um, another comment that came up was that the gray water provision, uh, which is outlined, technically would make washing your cars in the streets illegal due to the fact that it says including but not limited to discharging of recreational vehicles holding tanks. And so that's something that people were concerned with um, around the, or the language and the ordinance. Um, if the city is developing this program in the absence of working with the county and other jurisdictions, there's concern that we could potentially see an influx of RVs if we're the only safe RV program in the county. Um, enforcement shouldn't just fall on the police and there should be an interdepartmental approach that should be taken given that we 
also have code enforcement and parking enforcement. Um, some individuals express that their personal vehicles will be targeted, um, even though they're taxpaying homeowners. And we're going to discuss the funding for implementation later, but there was also some concerns around the fact that um, we haven't identified, you know, costs, um, the who's going to provide the services and where the funding will come from. I know today we received a memo on that, and I'm sure that, and I'll, I'll be sure to share this with members of the public as well, but I just wanted to share that um, with the council because people had asked that we express this during this meeting. And so that ends my comments on this item. Thank you, council member. Council member Brown. Thank you. I just wanted to make one additional comment, uh, a, a positive um, communication I received from uh, actually two groups who I believe are uh, beginning to connect with each other about um, volunteer efforts to um, develop some kind of um, supportive assistance to uh, folks who are living in their RVs around um, vehicle repair and you know addressing issues to get their vehicles um, roadworthy um, so people can move and also to um, potentially facilitate um, RV um, dumping because we don't have, as we've discussed and we know, um, don't have a lot of um, facilities for that and where we do, um, it is quite pricey. So um, there are efforts underway and, um, you know, I think, a, you know, a group of retired people, they said, we're retired people, we have time and, you know, we want to work on this. And so there, there's a couple of cool things happening that I just wanted to, um, and, you know, so this conversation, while it has been difficult, I think has elicited some um, community response that, um, you know, about ways that, that uh, you know, people can be involved and, and try to help us uh, help the city out and help our community out and the neighbors as, as well as our unhoused um, neighbors uh, moving forward. So I just wanted, so, you know, stay tuned for more um, and, and thank you for um, giving me an opportunity to, to raise that here. Thank you, council member. Council member uh, Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Um, thanks for bringing that up, Council Member Brown. I know there are also neighborhood groups who want to and are working on the same as supporting. Um, so I don't know if those are the two groups that have that have met up, and if not, then then maybe we can make help facilitate that. But there are neighborhood groups and community groups who also want to support those efforts of um, getting um, vehicle repair support and registration support and um, supporting where dumping fees for dumping. So. Um, I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, and then I, I just wanted to comment on Council Member Cummings' um, comment that community members have brought up that the subcommittee and staff have been actively working with the county. And um, well, maybe Director Butler can share more, but but the, the county is also looking at uh, standing up safe parking in unincorporated areas. So it won't be uh, only in the city. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. And I'll also queue up um, and I'll maybe look to um, Lee Butler um, potentially. Um, it just for the public to know that um, the county and the city also as part of the work through the two by two over the last year um, uh, and, and then uh, Director Butler's work with county, the lead on the county staff um, and our new homeless service uh, manager, encampment um, policy and kind of a more of a countywide sort of approach to encampments is is in the queue. Um, and I believe also Director Butler, we are also um, because we've you know received some funding from the state, we're also starting to tap into some technical uh, provider um, uh, that technical for providing um, uh, for encampment management, et cetera, through the state um, HCD, I believe. So this is all part of the governor's new um, multi-agency, multi-effort to basically, um, you know, bring about one point, I think it's about $1.3 billion um, for homelessness this year. 
um, about three times more than the federal government will be doing, but um, there are a number of different technical resource availabilities that are starting to show up because of that. Um, and obviously because of the two ordinances we've passed, um, it's it, we have opportunity to continue to work with HCD and other state agencies to kind of refine um, you know, um, the fact that many, many people unfortunately are, are sheltered outside in Santa Cruz. And so these ordinances start to move us um, towards finding uh, better resolution and better solutions. I don't know, Director Butler, I, th these are things that we've just learned about basically in the last couple of weeks as the governor's been rolling out a, a comprehensive program statewide. Sure, thanks Mayor Myers and council members. Um, uh, I'll just add on to that briefly um, in that we're doing a lot of things to help coordinate with the county and we have had some of those conversations with respect to how um, the county can um, locate um, RV and oversized vehicle um, parking opportunities, whether they're um, city run on uh, county property or if they're um, county owned and operated properties. Um, so those conversations are ongoing and we're also um, continuing a, a series of other conversations. I mentioned the, um, the conversations led by Dave Sepos um, with Sacramento State University, as well as um, the county has been um, uh, working with us and um, focus strategies and focus strategies has been providing some technical assistance to us. And then we're also working with the county and we've got an initial kickoff meeting tomorrow with respect to um, encampments and um, the city and county response. And that's actually going to um, also, uh, Watsonville has been invited to that as well. So it'll be a broader effort as it relates to um, that uh, technical assistance, which is also being um, supported by a nonprofit organization. Yeah, and I'll just finalize um, just for the public to know how the how these pieces are fitting together. Um, the the governor's created a new um, California Homeless Coordinating and Financing Council, um, and there's additional funding um, actually through a grant program um, that also looks at um, encampment solutions. Um, and specifically, the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz are mentioned as cities and counties who are, you know, what he's now calling um, sort of the the initial cohort of um, part of his governor's 100 day challenge. Um, and so again, um, this, we're, we're very much in the front lines of kind of where the governor and the, and the goals and objectives of a homeless response system that um, is literally sort of being Develop this coming year, um, and by being um, the recipient of, of you know this major investment, um, we hope to you know be in a really good spot in terms of continuing to rec receive resources. And I certainly understand the concern about how we pay for these things, um, and we'll certainly hear about that later today. But again, um, we um, we are at the front lines as a city now. Um, we were not there a year ago. Um, and the, the, you know we've do, through, do really do the work of John Laird and 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 uh, Assembly Member Stone. You know they've really raised the consciousness of of what we're faced here as a small city. So many resources for homelessness are going to the larger cities in California, cities of millions of people. Um, and because of the data and the information and the hard work of our staff um, and the work of our you know state electeds, we've really raised the awareness of the kinds of, of issues that we're focusing on. So. Again, um, for our community to know that this um, is not, um, these are not um, actions that we take lightly. They are very much a, a act, set of actions to actually position the city of Santa Cruz to get as much help as we can for the people who are in homelessness. Um, and also in the beginning of this year, um, the state has announced that they will be creating a new California Interagency Council on Homelessness. And again, you know, the work we do here, especially with our encampment management policies, um, will be looked at. And uh, I hope we can continue to receive state resources. Certainly, um, we're out of the gate in a really good spot. So um, just want to make sure that the community understands that these are not a punitive approach, but building upon that system of, of hopefully uh, resolution and, and better solutions to having people sleeping in their cars on the street. Um, any other 
comments or questions on this item? Uh, I know Vice Mayor Bruner, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah. Uh, my comment was um, a lot of great things were said, but my comment was regarding some members of the public and just really, I know that Director Butler uh, mentioned, touched on it earlier regarding the safe parking program and any update on that progress. And I think um, uh, there, just in talking to people um, who had reached out, there it wasn't clear um, exactly what a safe parking program was. And um, just kind of if there was update on the three tiers and really uh, for the members of the public to understand that um, it is a program um, that uh, we are proposing to direct staff to implement um, that would um, have elements, all the needed elements that are missing currently, um, which are uh, uh, designated areas with trash receptacles, restrooms, um, uh, water hygiene, access to um, services, social services, and connections to whatever needs are needed for whoever is um, in an oversized vehicle. So I know there um, has been work since our last meeting, and I just um, wondered, Lee, if you could give just a quick update on any progress with that. Sure, happy to, Vice Mayor Bruner. Thanks for that opportunity. And we have met in the past two weeks, we've met a number of times with um, our internal staff working groups, including um, both um, Public Works and um, uh, Police Department, as well as members of our uh, City Manager's Office team. And um, we also had a, um, a discussion with the Council Subcommittee um, related to the um, tiers. And um, we've been looking at a number of things. Um, first, with the um, with Tier 1, we are looking at the Police Department um, uh, parking lot there. And we talked through with police how that could work and how uh, we can reference, how we can put together reference materials for individuals at that at those locations that um, give them both the rules for um, that um, uh, program and how to connect with the the additional tiers. We've also talked about um, potential locations for the um, the additional tiers. That would be tier two in particular, um, and how that would be and overnight only program um, with um, access to the hygiene services um, that you mentioned and also um, how we would um, hope to um, partner with um, some nonprofits that um, could potentially for tier three have a longer term, even if it's not you know 24 seven all the time, but closer to 24 seven um, for the tier three, again, to provide that stability, but that's uh, yet to be determined in, in terms of um, that would require um, partnerships um, with uh, nonprofit organizations. And, and so uh, we're a little bit further along in our discussions with uh, tier one and tier two, but also uh, starting to think about tier three at the same time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cummings and Council Member Commentary Johnson. Um, Council Member Bruner just started a question in my head that I had last time and I wasn't able to ask. So I was just curious with, when it comes to people who are living in their vehicles, and Lee, I don't know if this has come up at all, um, but I, it's just out of curiosity. You know, when these, when we're having conversations with the county, um, because for example, there are people who are living in their vehicles who aren't having a negative impact. They really don't need, you know, mental behavioral health services. The issue is that they can't afford housing, right? And so I'm just wondering what kind of programs or services that the county has to address that population, which is really just a population of people who, you know, are down on their luck and can't find a, an affordable place to live. So they're living in their cars and, you know, just how that kind of factors in so that, you know, the people who we don't want to have, you know, who aren't causing problems, um, you know, really aren't being um, penalized for the fact that they have to live in their vehicles. 
So both, thank you, Councilmember Cummings. Um, both with the, the city and the county, there are opportunities for um, first and last month um, rent assistance and um, assistance related to um, uh, rental payments in general. Um, you know, there are, um, there's limited funding related to that and particularly limited staffing with respect to um, the, the county's um, rehousing wave, for example. Um, but they are looking at expanding that and um, offering that. That's the rehousing wave in itself has been focused on housing navigation for, for individuals who were in the COVID hotels. But they are looking at expanding that out to um, the armory um, where they're operating up there. And similar services could um, also assist individuals at the um, who at, at the. Um, safe sleeping locations. And we would be looking to do that is to the extent that we can um, connect individuals um, who are at the safe parking locations with the county service providers. Great. And is there any information on the city's website or the county's website um, regarding how we can connect people to those programs? The, the city's website um, is through our economic development department. Um, it is um, choosantacruz.com. There's information um, on various housing assistance programs there. Um, and um, the county does have um, some information on their website, but also some nonprofits that uh, I believe both of those websites will point individuals towards as some of them are um, operated through third parties. Thank you. Uh, Council member Colin Terry Johnson. Thank you. Yes, briefly, uh, I did forget to mention that uh, Vice Mayor Brunner, Council member Boulder and I are continuing to work uh, with staff and, and continuing to meet with community groups on the design of the safe parking program. Uh, so, so just wanted to make sure the public knew that we are staying engaged with this process. And then I did want to just again, I know acknowledged earlier, but for folks who weren't listening earlier, I wanted to acknowledge Director Butler and the team for how much work has been done, um, in particular around the safe parking in just a very short amount of time since our last meeting. So I wanted to acknowledge and thank you for that. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, uh, I will go ahead and take this item. This is item number 23 uh, on our consent public hearing, which has been pulled. And um, I will go ahead and take this out for uh, the members of the public who may want to speak to this item. Um, now is the time to press star nine on your phone uh, and that cues you up for um, public comment. Uh, when you hear, when is your time to speak and I will call off either your name or the last four digits of your phone number. Um, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and then the timer will be set to one minute. Uh, I have approved two groups um, that I'll take first, and um, these are group requests representing organizations, and I'll go ahead and have West Side Neighbors go first, and then I will have Stepping Up Santa Cruz go after that. So West Side Neighbors, uh, you requested uh, extra time, and uh, I'll go ahead and call you on you. Uh, I'm not sure which phone number I was told that, um, I believe Manuel Prado Prado was going to Prado was going to be the representative today, but I'm not sure which phone number you're on. Um, Bonnie, did you have any communications with their uh, person who was going to speak today? Um, just the name. I can lower the hands, and you can ask Manuel to raise his. Everyone else to keep their hands down, and Manuel raise his hand. Okay, great. Other than that, I have no. I don't know. Okay. I just lowered everybody's hand, so if Manuel okay. can raise his hand. If the representative from West Side Neighbors could raise their hand, I understood it would be uh, Manuel, but um, I believe Carol Polhamus also was another rep that... Is anyone here to speak on behalf of West Side Neighbors? Please raise your hand. Okay. Um, Bonnie, I'll see if they sh come back in. Um, I'll go ahead and take um, stepping up Santa Cruz and I see Serge um, had called in. And so Serge, please go ahead and 
press um, star six to unmute yourself and you will be ready to go. And it looks like maybe I have, um, maybe we did locate the um, West Side folks. So we'll, we'll look for that phone number next. But Serge, go ahead and go first, please. <clears throat> Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yep, we can, thank you. Okay, thanks. Good afternoon, City Council. My name is Serge Cagno and I'm speaking for Stepping Up Santa Cruz. I pay taxes, I volunteer for county boards, I volunteer for neighborhood courts, I volunteered for the city's past catch committee. I worked as a consultant last year, helping set up the COVID shelters and motels. I presently am the executive director of a nonprofit program. I've been a part of this community since the nineties. I love Santa Cruz and work to be a positive member of my community. I live in my van and I use it as a mobile office. With this proposed ordinance, I would not be able to have done that work because at times I worked nights supporting those programs as they were starting. There were other night staff at the Vets Hall Shelter who lived in their vehicles as well, and they would not have been able to do that work either with this ordinance. With this proposed ordinance, I would not be able to go downtown to a bar and spend time with friends after midnight because I couldn't park on the street. Nor would I be able to see a late night movie um, or visit, uh, stay the night at a friend's house if they didn't have a driveway for me to park in. Please stop saying doing something is better than doing nothing. Doing the wrong thing is still wrong. None of the nonprofits providing services or the county staff support this ordinance. There is no research showing that criminalizing homelessness is helping helpful to get people housed. Things you can do, work with the county and nonprofits to help those in need, provide an adequate number of syringe disposal con containers, provide a free sewage dump site within the city limits, stop vilifying all people living in vehicles as criminals who dump sewage, leave trash, steal and cause problems. Some of us are productive members of the community. As long as the safe parking is a required part of this ordinance, you're clearly illegally making it illegal and unwelcome for those living in their RVs to live in the city and work in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and see if we have the member from Westside Santa Cruz up uh, to be here. Is that number Phone number ending in maybe six nine five nine. Can we unmute them and see if that's them? Bonnie, press star six to unmute yourself. Are you with West Side Neighbors? No. Okay. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and <coughs> we'll take regular public comment now. Uh, go ahead, the person on the line, uh, ending in uh, phone number 6959, please go ahead. Press star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. This is Lynn Renshaw with Santa Cruz Together. Santa Cruz Together collectively supports this ordinance. This public comment uh, the point I want to make is that this public comment is only one way that people provide input. Most people are working right now or picking up kids. Instead, they call you guys earlier or send email ahead of meeting. 335 people emailed City Council about this second reading over the last weekend. 310 of those emails support the ordinance. 25 were opposed. This is consistent with the email public correspondence uploaded on the weekends before September 26th and October 26th. There were nearly, nearly 1,000 additional emails with about 10 times more people in favor of the ordinance compared to those opposing it. <clears throat> no one in the press, it assumes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I will go ahead and see if Westside Neighbors is up. Um, Bonnie, can you lower everybody's hands again and see if I can get the Westside Neighbors folks person queued? If you are the Westside Neighbors person, please raise your hand. Press star nine to, nine to raise your hand. Oh, there we go. Okay, I see phone number ending in 1943. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself and you'll have two minutes, please. Hi, this is Manuel Prado speaking on behalf of Westside Neighbors. 
uh, want to thank the council members who brought the ordinance forward in response to neighborhood concerns about the impacts of overnight RVs parking, you know, particularly in the west side uh, neighborhoods. Um, also want to thank the council members who voted to move it forward. As the previous speaker mentioned, we know that there's very strong support for this ordinance. Over 800 emails sent at the previous two meetings in support of the of the OVO, uh, as well as I think a thousand signature petitions to request enforcement of no overnight parking. This issue has become unmanageable as it exists now. We support the ordinance as a first step in addressing the valid concerns of the neighborhoods and businesses negatively impacted by this issue, as well as the needs of those living in their vehicles. We support the safe spaces parking expansion on city county property, not, not in the neighborhoods. We do not want people sleeping overnight in their vehicles on city streets. We support providing services to help people improve their situations, including county case management and services. We support enforcement of the existing overnight parking rules and the establishment of a program, including enforcement that will help people to move to safe spaces where they can receive supportive services and sanitation services. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that concludes the two uh, groups that had extra time at two minutes. So I'll go ahead and just uh, cue everybody up who wants to speak on this. Um, again, if you press star nine to, to put your hand up and I'll go ahead and take caller uh, phone number ending in 7211. Press star six to unmute yourself, please. Phone number ending in. Oh, hi, can you hear me there? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Excellent. Oh, hi, it's Peter Cook. So I've lived in, in the neighborhood Lower West uh, Side, and I've seen over the years that by not enforcing these rules, we continually have new people coming in that see a new license plate from Georgia, one's from Washington State, one's from Canada. And by having this open door policy, what we're doing is we're continually allowing new people to come into our neighborhood and our community and overburden our um, system so that we're not able to help the homeless people that are here already. And so I think we need to have rules in place so that we're not continually just allowing more and more people to always come into this neighborhood, bringing in new vehicles and new problems on a continual basis. And so I think that would be for the homeless people that are already here as well as the neighbors that live in the neighborhoods and the businesses, I think it's really important that we have some rules in place so that we are able to start actually addressing the problem, not always just growing the problem. So I thank the uh, council for taking this on. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next we have uh, Sabina. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. I want to call out that in the oral communications on the agenda, it says that no extra time for groups will be allowed, but it seems like you've given extra time for groups, and so I'd love the legal counsel to weigh in on that because it seems pretty unfair to me. I also want to call out that this is obviously a cruel and inhumane ordinance that is going to cause more people to be unhoused, and I wish you would stop just listening to your wealthy uh West Side homeowners that are contributing to your campaigns and actually listen to the folks that this is going to affect. Um, all of this is super disappointing, but we're all disappointed in you guys, so not very surprising. Thank you. Next, I have Hollis Molloy. Hollis lowered their hand. So. Okay, yeah, I was gonna say it just disappeared. Okay, phone number now ending in 0249, please. Hello, this is Carol Polhamus. I wanna thank council members Golder, Bruner, and Kalantari Johnson for bringing forward this ordinance and thanks to the five council members who supported passing it on the first reading. This week, somebody brought to my attention that there are two apps. One's called iOverlander, one's called RV Life. Both list 
specifically free parking overnight on the Lower West Side. People who are living in vehicles by choice should be able to afford an RV park. People who are living in vehicles out of necessity are in a whole different category. They need help. I very much support expanding, excuse me, the Safe Spaces Parking Program and providing easy access to sanitation and services for people who need assistance in improving the conditions that they're living in. Thank you very much for supporting this ordinance and for passing it today. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 4844. Well, it doesn't sound like the public is really being included in this discussion. I'm Robert Norris of Huff. Uh, the Butler memo that you discussed has not been made available on the agenda that I could see. So I'm not sure how you're going to square this with the Brown Act. You're prov there's no provision for any kind of real new places to go police lot. Are we kidding? It's a lot of talk. Now, it's not that intelligent comment from pu the public would necessarily be much point since it's really clear that the council has a preconceived enforcement agenda that's directed at driving homeless people out of town, particularly if they live in their vehicles. And it's ridiculous, of course, they'll just drive them onto the streets. For the community, however, and any interested council members who want to take action to directly monitor support and protect folks in RVs and vehicles and not wait for Lee Butler's latest vague report that comes in and simply asserts what we already know. And so really that's what you listeners have to do. You know, money for the homeless is going to be used for enforcement bucks to clear the park. Nervous privilege and walk their dogs. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have uh, Sophie. Hi, um, I've been a resident in Santa Cruz for about 10 years. Um, and I also just want to say I'm deeply saddened and disgusted by this ordinance and the myths and prejudice that it's based on. Um, as you all have said previously, the only thing this ordinance offers is that it increases criminalization for activities that are already covered by existing law and enforced by city and county staff. So you've made it clear that your priority is to spend city resources on having the city attorney take on prosecuting people in just desperate situations um, and directing more ticketing rather than prioritizing setting up um, plans ahead of time um, and resources that will actually solve the problems that folks have emailed in about. Because I doubt that the majority of people who feel that this is an issue that's affecting their neighborhoods um, think that the only option is to jail everyone and get them out of town. I think there's plenty of people who also agree it's a problem and that there are things we can do. Um, and I think that directing the in advance, the winter will already be in a desperate situation now. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Hollis Malloy. Yes, hello. Thank you for taking the call. Um, I'm in full support of the overnight ban. And there's a couple of things I'll take a lead from some of the council members and uh, saying, I think there's some information the public should know, which is there is a huge distinction between the unhoused and these problem RVs that the police and the West side uh, are dealing with right now. Um, people who simply are in their vehicles living uh, unhoused do not get the police called on them. They do not uh, disrupt public peace and they are not the issue that we are complaining about. What we are complaining about is the problem RVs that is drunk and disorderly conduct, child endangerment, uh, environmental issues. The city dump won't take these RVs anymore because it's an environmental issue and they will get penalized. Well, leaving them on the city streets is a dereliction of duty. We must get these problem RVs, they're environmental hazards off the streets. Uh, for the advocates saying that we don't care, well, this, this clearly has safe sparking. We are offering services it requires willing participation. And so thank you for the overview of the ordinance. Thank you. Um, I'll ask uh, one more time if there's anyone here that wants to speak to item number 23 on our agenda, which is the uh, ordinance on the oversized vehicles. Please uh, press star nine to raise your hand. Okay, it looks like we have um, 
heard from the public. So I will go ahead and bring this back um, for a motion and um, a vote by the council. I'd look for a motion by uh, council, uh, council, uh, council member Kalantari Johnson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you to all the community members who have called in and who have written letters and who have taken time to meet with various council members. Um, again, uh, your input helps us design the safe parking program. It helps us move forward. And um, this is, as many people said, the first step. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we will be moving forward with a services oriented approach and we will get folks into a pathway to housing, which is ultimately what we wanna be working towards in everything that we do. So with that, I will move to, um, let's see, I'm looking for the motion language. Do I read it straight from here? Move to adopt ordinance number 2021-20 amending title 10 vehicle and traffic at chapter 10.04 definitions in chapter 10.40 stopping standing and parking and chapter 10.41 citywide parking permit pertaining to the parking of oversized vehicle and chapter 16.19 stormwater and urban runoff pollution control at section 16.19.070 discharge of sewage prohibited. Motion as written in the um, agenda packet. <clears throat> Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Watkins. I'll go ahead and second that motion. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Terry Johnson um, to adopt ordinance number 2021-20. Uh, and um, we have a second by Council Member Watkins. And I would ask for a roll call vote, please. Council Members Watkins. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Aye. Brown? No. Cummings? No, and for the record, I'd just like to say that um, I and many members of the community who I've spoken with agree that we should be addressing problematic RVs, um, but this ordinance really targets any vehicle over 20 feet, even for those people who are not um, problematic or homeless and also that it fails to address the previous concerns raised when this was appealed to the Coastal Commission. So I'm supportive of all the services that are being offered and look forward to seeing how we can roll this out, but I, I do not support this ordinance for many of the um, reasons that were brought forward by the public, so no. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. <clears throat> That uh, motion will pass uh, with five for the for the five voting for uh, and two voting against. So that motion does pass. Um, we are going to go ahead and take a come back in about two fifty. Take a ten minute break here. Um, and for the I, for the members of the public, I'm going to uh, move item number twenty four ahead of item number twenty five. So item number twenty four is uh, the appointment of our new city manager. We're gonna take that um, item when we return at 2.50, and then we'll uh, go to item number 24, which is the um, uh, public hearing and adoption of our 2020 urban water management plan. We'll take a 10 minute break and then come back. Okay, thank you.
Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure uh, Council Member Brown and Watkins will come in as we get open back up. Um, I just wanna, for members of the public, uh, we've made a, just a slight uh, change in our, um, in our uh, agenda this afternoon. We're taking item number 25 now, and then we will take item number 24 following this item. And uh, item number tw 25 is the appointing uh, of our new city manager, approving the city management manager employment agreement and authorizing the mayor to execute the agreement. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to call on it, comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the city council for deliberation and action. If you are, again, uh, interested in this item, uh, please press star nine to queue yourself up um, and we'll move to public comment um, after uh, a brief uh, number of uh, comments and discussion uh, regarding the items in the, in the item. I'll go ahead and start um, this item and I see Mr. Huffaker has joined us, which is great. Um, I first want to start the item um, by recognizing and thanking um, Interim City Manager uh, Rosemary Menard for um, coming uh, on top of her already very busy job as our uh, water director um, to really fill uh, the shoes of, you know, our retiring city manager, Martine Bernal, who was really one of two uh, city managers that the that the city has had in the last gosh almost probably 40 years I think I don't know the exact amount but again um, long term longevity um, and Rosemary has uh, not only filled those shoes but um, she has just really dove in head 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 first in really picking up a lot of very complex um, uh, policy issues the council was working on. Um, uh, you know, getting ourselves ready for our budget, um, looking at obviously some uh, difficult policies around homelessness, uh, looking at um, some of the development proposals that we're currently struggling with. Her leadership has been greatly appreciated by the city council members. I know that all of us have learned from her since her appointment starting in August. And um, I know she'll continue to be a, a leader amongst our department heads um, as she transitions back to the water department um, and helps our um, incoming city manager, Mr. Huffaker, um, get ready and um, succeed um, in the transition. So Rosemary, I think all of us just really wanna give you a round of applause and thank you for everything you've done. I know we've got a few more months working with you, which we will enjoy, um, but again, really, really just um, stepping out of a very complex department that you're doing and leading and jumping into city manager was really a gift at this point in time. So um, we're very, very, lucky welcome. Though. very lucky that you did that for us and we so appreciate it. Um, I'm extremely uh, thrilled to introduce to our community and folks watching today our um, the council's choice to be our new city manager, Mr. Matt, Matt Huffaker, he's here uh, on the screen. Uh, Matt is coming to us from the city of Watsonville with a over 15 year career in um, city administration and city management, most um, recently as the city manager for the city of Watsonville. Um, and uh, I know we all, um, we all feel that our, uh, our, our, our city in common here in the county um, is giving up a great leader um, but we um, are just thrilled that Matt has decided to come uh, work here with the city of Santa Cruz and embark on what I think um, is an exciting decade of projects and programs and policy that this council and past councils have set um, in course and um, including new civic buildings, um, <coughs> really committing to um, housing um, affordability uh, long-term and also looking at other, other economic development um, opportunities for helping our businesses stabilize and grow, as well as um, completing some major infrastructure needs such as um, rehabilitating our wharf um, and working on the Civic Auditorium eventually, 
and um, our swimming pool and other needs. So Matt is um, stepping into a very big job. Um, his energy is contagious. Um, there was unanimous consent from the city council about bringing forward his nomination as our choice for city manager. Uh, and <coughs> we are pleased to present um, uh, him as our choice. And um, I'll close there and offer my council members <coughs> before she go into a coughing fit. I would offer my uh, fellow uh, colleagues to, uh, you know, make comments. And Matt, if you um, would like to also comment at the end. And then uh, the item before us for the public is that we will uh, um, be appointing Mr. Huffaker. We'll be approving the employment agreement and then authorizing my execution of that agreement. So I'll turn it over to my council member colleagues to see if they have further comments. And then um, Matt, again, we'd love to hear from you if you have a few words. So. Anybody want to queue up for any additional comments? Council member Colin Tari Johnson. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, Matt, I have had the privilege of working with you on some of the projects I've done in the city of Watsonville. And um, I know how much you care about community members throughout our county. Um, I know how dedicated you are, and I'm just um, really thrilled that we'll get to work with each other in this capacity. Um, and roll up our sleeves and, and do the hard work that's ahead of us. So thank you. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to um, thank all the council members and the staff for all the time that was taken to um, go through this process. Um, it is, has not been an easy process to, and I just want the public to know that, you know, it has not been an easy process to land on who our new city manager was going to be, and um, but you know it's it's probably one of the most important jobs in this community, and um, it took a lot of time for us to go through all the various applications and um, multiple rounds of interviews, and um, and I'm just happy to see uh, that Matt is going to be our next city manager. Um, I've had an opportunity to interact with Matt on a number of occasions um, last year in particular during COVID when we were having the city manager mayor meetings frequently um, and at a variety of different conferences. And um, I always heard good things about Matt from people who were working in the city of Watsonville, um, members of the council down in Watsonville. And so I'm just uh, excited to um, see what's to come for the city of Santa Cruz and um, um, look forward to working with Matt moving forward. Thank you, council member. Council member Watkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and I'll just echo my colleagues' comments and express my appreciation, one, um, to Rosemary for stepping in in this interim capacity and doing an exceptional job while, while being here. I'm really grateful for your leadership and excited to have you also support our incoming uh, city manager, Matt, and I want to welcome you, and I look forward to working with you um, in this capacity, and I know that the community will get to know you in the coming months and as well as the staff. and. Um, yeah, lots of great work to do. And so thank you uh, for taking on this role and um, onward. Thank you, Council Member. Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, Matt, welcome to Santa Cruz. <laughs> we um, really went through a long process and I uh, would really like to thank our HR staff, recruiting firm, the city staff, everyone that uh, walked us through this process. Uh, we worked together as a team. I really appreciated um, the council through the interview process and um, we've landed with this appointee, Matt Hefeker, who I'm very confident will bring wonderful strength I look forward to working with you, Matt. Thank you for making Santa Cruz your next home. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Any other council members? Okay, I will go ahead and Matt, if you um, if you are willing and uh, yeah, we'd love to hear a few words from you. So again, congratulations. Yeah, very happy to. And uh, for starters, uh, Mayor Myers and council, I'm, I'm just incredibly, humbled and excited to be considered for this opportunity. As many of you have mentioned and the mayor has mentioned, 
it's a really exciting time for Santa Cruz. It's a special community. And I'm very much looking forward to rolling up my sleeves and working with each of you, uh, working with our incredible city team and our community members to help emerge from this pandemic stronger and to continue advancing the many uh, important and exciting initiatives that are underway while also having the opportunity to continue supporting our region as a whole, um, as I know that many of you are committed to that as well. So I just couldn't be more excited and um, very grateful for having this opportunity and uh, look forward to, uh, to the days and weeks to come. So thank you. Thank you, Matt, and thanks for joining us today. I know that you're, uh, you're queued to go back to your council meeting as well. So I really appreciate you taking the time um, I will go ahead and take this out unless there's any other comments um, from council. I'll go ahead and take this out for public comment at this time. We're on item number 25, which is um, adoption of the resolution in appointing our new city manager, Mr. Matt Huffaker. And if you do want to comment on this item, please press star nine on your phone. To raise your hand and I'm not seeing anyone out there. Um, to raising their hand. So I will go ahead and bring this back to council for a motion and um, we'll go from there. Vice Mayor Bruner. <coughs> oh, you're muted. I, I would like to uh, make a motion to adopt resolution appointing the new city manager, approving the city manager employment agreement and authorizing the mayor to execute the agreement, uh, appointing Matt Huffaker as the new city manager. Thank you, Vice Mayor and Council Member Boulder. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by Vice Mayor Bruner um, seconded by Council Member Boulder um, on adopting the resolution to appoint uh, Matt Huffaker as our new city manager, approving the employment contract, excuse me, employment agreement, and authorizing the mayor to execute the agreement. And um, Bonnie, could we have a roll call vote, please? Council Members Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? I, and I apologize, I had to step out for a moment, but I'm also thrilled that you're um, going to be joining us, Mr. Huffaker. Hi. Cummings? Hi. Boulder? Hi. Vice Mayor Bruner? Hi. And Mayor Myers? Hi. That motion passes unanimously. Matt, we will see you here on January 3rd. Thanks so much. Thank you, take care. Okay, you too. Okay, we will now move to item number 24, which is a public hearing for adoption of the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan and Water Shortage Contingency Plan. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time in, time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, our presenter today is Sarah Easley Perez, principal planner with our water department. So I'll turn it over to Sarah. Um, uh, Mayor, I'm gonna give a little um, intro to this. In, in my former world, which I will be going back shortly. Um, I This was one of the items that Heidi Lukenbach, the interim director of the water department and I agreed that I would kind of keep a tab on as we went forward along with uh, the financial item that you're gonna hear more about next month or next meeting. Um, but I did wanna give a little bit of an introduction to this. So the urban water management plan uh, of which the water storage contingency plan is a part is a requirement that the water department has um, from the state. And it's a plan that has to be developed and updated uh, every five years. It's quite a uh, regulatorily driven document with lots of, you know, the, the charts and the date and the analysis has to be exactly in this format so the state can be able to sort of look at things kind of across the board and across a whole range of very different kinds of water utilities. And sometimes that works and sometimes that's a little bit of trying to put a round peg in a square hole for individual 
um, projects and programs such as you know, the one we have where we're not connected to any of the state water infrastructure, et cetera. But fundamentally, we worked this plan together. We've done this, this is probably, I think the first round might have been in 2010 that we had to do one of these. And uh, so we've had to update it every, well, actually even earlier than that, uh, multiple times. So it's a, it's a project that is required, uh, the process in front of you for, with respect to the uh, review and adoption has to be in the public hearing format it's required by the state. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah, who's been the main architect and project manager for this, this and uh, let her give you a brief overview. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I'm Sarah Perez, Principal Planner with the Water Department. And I'm here today with Benjamin Pink, our Environmental Project Panelist, to provide an overview of the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan which includes the water shortage contingency plan um, that's before council today for a public hearing and consideration of adoption. I'm gonna run through a quick presentation um, and overview and Ben and I will be available to answer any questions. Um, some quick background on the urban water management plan. Um, as Rosemary explained, um, this is uh, driven by regulatory requirements um, that we update the plan every five years it is a plan that captures a snapshot of the year 2020, looks back to the previous five years between 2015 and 2020, and looks forward on a 20 to 25 year time horizon. Um, there are a number of, of required topics that are um, will be included and I'll be overviewing some, um, some of those key topics. Um, some quick background on the water shortage contingency plan. Um, this plan is required to be a part of the urban water management plan, but at the same time, it must stand alone and be adopted independently. Um, the city council did adopt an interim updated um, water shortage contingency plan in early 2021. Um, and this allowed us to implement in 2021 um, as it was needed. Um, but there were some new requirements from 2020 that were deferred in that 2021 plan that have now been included. And those include some um, regulatory requirements such as describing the process by which we um, evaluate our water year and some other requirements like that. Um, so in the 2020 urban water management plan, the water shortage contingency plan is comprised of two components. It's um, chapter eight, um, which is water shortage contingency planning and appendix O, which is the water shortage contingency <laughs> implementation. And that appendix is an updated version of that interim updated water shortage contingency plan that was adopted earlier this year. Um, I just wanted to quickly go over a uh, public review of the urban water management plan and water shortage contingency plan. The plan has been avail made available um, on the city website, the downtown library, um, in person at the engineering counter at the water department. We did uh, publish um, notices of public hearing in the newspaper. Um, we additionally took the plan to the water commission for their recommendation. Um, for adoption to you. Um, and to date, we have not received any public comment um, on the plan. Um, moving into some of the data of the urban water management plan, um, there's a lot going on in this graph, but I can provide a quick overview. Um, this graph looks at 1951 through the year 2020. Uh, population is shown in green. We have accounts in purple. Um, water production in red, and along the bottom, it shows our annual um, precipitation. Um, and additionally, uh, droughts are highlighted um, in red. And the main takeaway here I wanted to point out was really the diversion um, in 2020 of population, where population continues to increase, um, but water demand has really been steadily falling since um, 2020. So we've really seen a disconnect there between growth and a water demand. And that's due primarily to uh, conservation, changes in water code, 
and more efficient use of water. Um, additionally, um, in 2014, you see a large drop in demand here during our last drought. Um, so our community really came together and conserved during that drought. But since then, um, water demand has really not rebounded. We've maintained at um, a very low rate of water use. Um, looking ahead at projected water use, which is a requirement of the urban water management plan, um, we can see um, this table here is in uh, million gallons. So in 2020, our um, demand or our water use was um, 2.6 billion gallons. And in 2045, when we expect population to increase by about 18%, we're only projecting about a 4% increase in water use. Um, so really a very slow increase in water use. Um, and that, again, is due to plumbing codes, ongoing conservation, and um, the high efficiency of new development, especially multifamily development. Um, this slide looks at our compliance with uh, Senate Bill XB7X, which was um, passed in 2009. And this required all urban water suppliers to reduce urban water use by 20% by 2020. Um, so this, this uh, 2020 report was at reporting out on how well we did that. Um, this orange line here was our target at, and 110 was our target to meet that goal. And our uh, gallons per capita per day here is uh, 74 with our GPCD. Um, so we very well met our goal of 110. Um, and additionally, I wanted to point out this uh, green line, our residential per capita water use. It's not required to be calculated for XB 7X7, but at 47, um, we're among, we have one among the lowest residential water use per capita in the state. Um, this is a quick overview of our water supply. Um, we where our system relies primarily on surface water sources with about 90% of our supply coming from our North Coast Springs on Dell and Laguna and Majors, um, the San Lorenzo River, as well as our single surface water reservoir, Loch Lomond. And we get about 5% of our water supply um, from our belts wells in the Live Oak area, and those operate during uh, the summer dry season. Uh, moving on to water service reliability. Um, to summarize some of the major constraints on our water sources, um, our local supply um, variability as paired with our limited storage with having just one uh, surface water storage reservoir um, are, are challenging to our supply. This uh, water year classification graph shows um, rainfall from 1921 through 2020. Um, and it's classified by wet, normal, dry, and critically dry years. And the main takeaway from this graph is an incredible amount of variability in the type of water years that I get, that we get. And uh, in addition, in the years, um, in the 2000s, we're seeing a lot of whiplash weather where dry dries followed by wet wets, which makes it very challenging to operate a water supply system with limited storage. Um, some of the additional challenges that the water department faces are um, ecosystem restoration and protected species. Um, our, our goal is to provide uh, um, habitat supportive of an anadromous species, coho salmon and steelhead trout um, while operating our water system. Um, and there are challenges in, um, in working those together. We additionally face constraints on our existing water rights, as well as uh, source water quality in our existing surface water sources and uh, treatment capacity. Um, so in short, 
So to ensure future reliability, um, we are safeguarding against future water shortage by implementing future water supply projects that are described in the urban water management plan. Um, this includes implementation of our water supply augmentation strategy, um, which we've been pursuing um, since 2015 um, at the direction of city council. Um, and we have uh, four elements of water supply augmentation um, ranging from demand management, which is conservation, transfers and exchanges, aquifer storage and recovery, and as a backup to that, either recycled water or desalination with recycled water currently prioritized. Um, in addition to that, we're implementing um, a number of other projects to help uh, implement the water supply augmentation strategy. Um, those include the Santa Cruz Water Rights Project. Um, this project is wrapping up its final EIR and it's expected to come to City Council next month in December. That includes uh, modifications to our existing water rights, um, water supply augmentation components, as well as uh, surface water diversion improvements. Um, and we are additionally implementing our Santa Cruz water program, uh, upgrading a lot of a number of our major infrastructure facilities, including our single uh, surface water treatment plant, the Grand Graham Hill water treatment plant, raw water pipelines, and um, improvements to the Tate diversion. Um, this slide looks at a couple of the required reliability assessments of the urban water management plan. Um, the drought risk assessment, which is this assessment here, um, looks at near-term supply reliability from 2021 through 2025, assuming the next five years are drought. Um, and the takeaway here is um, if we assume our water rights modifications, which include um, agreed flows that are protective of fisheries, so those anadromous, anadromous fisheries in our watersheds, um, before we've implemented but before we've implemented water supply augmentation projects, um, we project a fairly significant shortage if we had five years of consecutive drought. Um, this projected supply availability analysis, it looks out on a longer term from 2025 to 2045. And in that we can assume the implementation of our water supply augmentation strategy. And we see an improved reliability where we expect supply um, to meet projected demand going forward um, along, as, as long as we implement those uh, supply projects. Um, this slide looks at our demand management measures, our conservation programs. The city has a long history. Um, this graph goes back to 1981 of implementing uh, conservation programs, which has brought us to um, having among the lowest per capita residential water use in California. Um, the very low water use um, is um, great in a lot of ways in terms of meeting demand, preserving water resources, um, but it also presents some challenges with a hardened demand that makes it harder for our customers to cut back further during temporary periods of drought. Um, so that demand hardening um, really necessitates that uh, our implementation of our supply augmentation um, to safeguard our, our future water supplies. Um, next, I'm going to overview the water shortage contingency plan. Um, as uh, many of you are aware, I'm sure, this May through October, we implemented the stage one water shortage warning from our water shortage contingency plan with the goal of a 10% reduction in peak season demand. Um, based on that experience, we made some minor modifications to our existing water shortage contingency plan. Um, and those changes are summarized here. Um, we added a couple of core principles. Um, we made explicit some flexibility in the way the plan is implemented, um, as well as clarified um, allotment exceptions, who does and doesn't qualify for very exceptions. I'm looking at uh, 2021 implementation, um, a couple of highlights. Um, we had targeted monthly outreach to educate customers um, who exceeded their allotment. And this brought down um, from customers exceeding from 34% in May to 25% in October. So we were able to reach um, a number of people. Um, we processed over uh, 5,000 
uh, exception requests through our system with um, no appeals. Um, and additionally, we implemented uh, water smart software, um, which helps uh, decrease the level of manual processing. And we were uh, successful in getting almost 40% of residential accounts registered on the portal and 32% uh, of single family accounts um, went into the portal and actually updated their profiles, um, which is great. Um, we expect this to be a key tool for us um, moving forward. Um, with that, um, I want to just summarize our next steps for the urban water management plan and the water shortage contingency plan. Um, today, we have um, the public hearing that's upcoming and your consideration of adoption by resolution um, of the two plans uh, individually. Uh, following that, within 30 days of adoption, um, the plan will be filed with uh, Department of Water Resources. And within 30 days of that filing with Department of Water Resources, we will also make the plan, the final plan, uh, publicly available and um, provide it to the jurisdictions that we serve water. And uh, that brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you for that presentation. Um, I will go ahead and see if council members have questions regarding the presentation. Um, thanks, Sarah, that was great. Uh, any questions from council members at this time? Not seeing any hands. Okay. Okay, um, I will go ahead and uh, take this out to our public right now and see if uh, we have any attendees in our meeting today that would like to comment on this item. If you do, if you would like to comment on this item, which is the adoption of the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan and Water Shortage Contingency Plan, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand <coughs> at this point. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted, and then we'll set the timer for two minutes. Is there anyone in the um, attendee meeting attendees today that want to speak to this item? I do want to recognize that uh, Water Commissioner uh, Doug Engfer is on, I see, in the audience. So, Doug, thank you to the Water Commission for shepherding this to us. I uh, just want to recognize you. Uh, I'm not seeing any raised hands in our audience, so I will go ahead and bring it back to the council, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, council member Cummings. Yeah, I'm happy to move the staff recommendation. I did um, just have one kind of question of curiosity. Um, you know, there's the potential for the university to be expanding, uh, you know, in the, in the future. And I'm just wondering how university expansion and population on the university campus might influence <coughs> The water saving plans um, in the future. Um, water management plans under drought. Yeah, I'd like to field that question and then um, uh, Sarah or um, <laughs> you could add in. Um, as, as you know, the university had, uh, had done a lot of work between the 2005 and the 2020 LRDPs and uh, basically kind of added about 10,000 students to their enrollment during that period of time and had their water uh, use stay pretty much the same as it was. So uh, they did project a, uh, the in their uh, EIR, they projected 192 million gallons of additional demand for the 20 year period that they were working on. That demand is integrated into the forecast information that uh, you saw. And uh, it doesn't mean that we, you know, support what's going to happen or don't support it, but we plan for uh, including it. And you can see that uh, even with that additional demand, which presumably is uh, related to a lot of additional housing that they were planning to have on campus, right, uh, that, that we're still able to um, incorporate that. There are a couple of other issues that we've been, uh, that we've talked to the university about in our comments having to do with the potential for them developing alternative supplies, which we don't support because they would come out of the car system, which underlies the upper campus, but could potentially have negative impacts on water quantity and water quality, particularly temperature in the lower river by changing 
the dynamics and the amount of flow that's coming out of that karst resource into the lower San Lorenzo River. That could have a negative impact, impact on our um, ability to support the anatomist fisheries that we're, we've done a lot of work on. So I think that's a kind of a high level overview of, uh, of that issue. Thank you, Rosemary. Any other comments or questions? We have a motion by council member Cummings that needs a second. I'll go ahead and second that. Um, any other uh, comments from council members? I just want to, um, <clears throat> again, thank our um, water director and our water department for all the work you guys do, um, you know, for a city of our size, we have one of the most progressive and proactive um, water departments in the state of California. So, and it shows in our conservation um, uh, statistics. We have a very aware public um, and we have uh, a really great laser focus on not only um, modernizing and updating and taking care of our water system, which a lot of communities, unfortunately, um, can usually oftentimes lose track of, um, but we've also made this huge commitment to actually simultaneously, um, as we take care of water for humans, we've also made the commitment to take wa take care of uh, water for, for our fish and wildlife species that depend on our, uh, especially our streams that we get our water sources from. So um, we're very lucky to have such a competent group of people managing um, the most important resource that our city, <laughs> our city survives on. So um, just want to compliment you, um, Rosemary, and your whole department on um, the work that you guys continue to bring forward. Um, really, really. Uh, those of us who, yeah, you know, we we probably maybe won't recognize it as we're sitting here, but future generations will definitely be um, very thankful for all the proactive work you guys do um, with regarding to our water supply and uh, managing it for the future folks. Uh, with that, I will go ahead and um, ask for a roll call uh, vote. We have a motion by um, Council Member Cummings, seconded by myself, and this will be to adopt. Um, uh, the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan and Water Shortage Contingency Plan. Uh, and it is uh, adopting a resolution for both the management plan and the contingency plan. And can we have a roll call vote, please, Bonnie? Council Members Watkins? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. So thanks again. Okay, we will move on to our next item um, under general business. Uh, and this will be Item number 26, which is health and all policies year one implementation report and fiscal year 2022 to 2024 work plan. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the city council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. I will invite up uh, Tef Tiffany Weiss-West, our Sustainability and Climate Action Manager. Welcome, Tiffany. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, Tiffany Weiss-West, Sustainability and Climate Action Manager in the City Manager's Office. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you for the presentation. Um, I'm very pleased to bring to you after uh, some time uh, the year one implementation work plan um, progress report as well as the um, community well-being indicators that we're proposing adopting um, and our work plan for the next two years for health and all policies. Um, in January of last year, 2020, uh, City Council adopted the year one implementation work plan after 
um, more than or nearly two years um, of work evaluating what health and all policies might look like here at the city, looking at how other agencies have operationalized it and conducting a series of listening sessions um, led uh, by then Mayor uh, Martine Watkins. Um, that resulted in this work plan that you see here today uh, that was a follow-on to the city council policy and the ordinance that was adopted in November of 2019. This year one implementation work plan contained five objectives, eight actions, and a number of different process and impact evaluation metrics. The outcome evaluation metrics are the ones that we're bringing to you here today. So that was the last piece that, um, that uh, was outstanding. Um, just to look at the progress um, of those on those objectives, which is detailed out um, much more in the agenda report uh, for this item. But uh, chiefly these five um, objectives we, we have achieved. Um, the first was really preparing guidance on how do we actually look at equity, public health, and sustainability, the three pillars of health and all policies in our agenda reports, because that was one of the requirements from the ordinance and the policy that, that came through. Um, we developed a guidance document, a half hour training video, and we've conducted a number of group trainings on how to incorporate health and all policies into the agenda report. That guy, uh, we'll see a bit later on what the quick reference chart looks like to guide folks through that process and thinking through these three pillars um, with respect to their item. We also um, have brought forward today a framework for measuring and reporting on equity, um, health and sustainability and improving the well-being of our community. I think it's important to remember that um, these uh, these community well-being metrics are those that we expect to see on the yearly or really more the decadal scale of change. This is not like our interim recovery plan that has quarterly um, metrics that we're tracking that do change more frequently. We're looking for the longer term change and identifying the trends in those changes. And that um, those proposed uh, indicators are also an attachment to the agenda report. It's seven pages. And fortunately, uh, those all come from um, our uh, county data share site. So they're very easy to update. Um, we also uh, said that we would conduct an annual evaluation of this effort and report to council. That is what we're doing here today is reporting for really it's been a year plus um, and this will next we will do our next annual reporting one year from now um, at the end of calendar year 2022. Um, our fourth objective was to ensure new staff commissioners and leadership are trained in all three pillars of health and all policies. And we've really taken an iterative and somewhat experimental approach to this. Um, we did add uh, with human resources a number of new trainings beyond those that are mandated by law around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and some more, some deeper topics. Um, we did uh, have over 200 staff uh, go through those trainings. Um, we also conducted, and many of you participated, or I think maybe a couple of you participated in March of this year in our leadership equity screening workshop, which was a really valuable, um, I think, workshop um, that allowed us to explore these topics in much more depth than I think we have before. And also as an attachment to this agenda report, you see the summary outcomes of that workshop, which I think are really interesting. And then lastly, um, the, the last objective was to support uh, stakeholder and partner uh, convenings. And we were looking for one or two cross-sectoral convenings, and we did do uh, more than those. Um, we, we participated um, in a couple course coffee chats, um, a regional sustainability and equity convening, as well as on the national level, the National Association um, of cities, uh, counties, health officers um, as well. There's a lot of interest in what we're doing here in Santa Cruz with health and all policies as other uh, jurisdiction, uh, jurisdictions across the U.S. are doing the same thing, exploring what can health and all policies 
mean in our jurisdiction. So that's been very rewarding uh, interacting with these other folks and learning what they're doing as well that we can bring back to our work here today. So that's really a snapshot of where we've been. Also in your agenda report, you, you probably saw in the table one, that there are over 60 new and ongoing projects, programs, policies, and other initiatives um, that align with health and all policies. And I think that's rather a, a, an astounding body of work. Um, and you'll see in that table um, which pillars uh, are directly uh, applicable or, or being addressed in that table. So S crossed by P is sustainability by public health. Um, in case there is any confusion on what that nomenclature meant um, in that column of that table. This is what the agenda report uh, guidance quick reference chart looks like. This, of course, accompanies, it's the short version of our broader guidance document that's fairly simple and gives some really concrete examples of how folks have incorporated health and all policies language in the agenda report. And I thank you all for continuing to look for that language and ask for it. Um, as you can see, this quick reference chart has each of the three pillars down the left hand side and then ask a number of prompting questions to really kind of get the juices flowing and and instigate kind of some deeper thought and analysis as to how these pillars either have been incorporated or have not into this item. And for the equity piece, we're really drawing on, we sought to not reinvent the wheel on uh, tools that already existed, such as Monotma County, Oregon's um, equity and empowerment lens. Um, and this is really the equity piece of our quick reference chart that we um, ask people to take a look at. And in fact, this quick reference chart and the Maloma County 5 piece uh, that you see on the screen here, it does not only be, need to be used for the agenda report. It can be utilized at the beginning of a project, a policy, an initiative to think through from the beginning and do some planning to ensure that those principles are incorporated throughout. So we're offering it as kind of the, the moment in time when it comes to council, but really this can be leveraged in a lot of ways. And in fact, many departments or several departments have already begun to do so. This then uh, is page one of seven pages of the proposed community well-being indicators. And a few things to note about this. Uh, number one, it, we align with the core conditions for health and well-being, seeing as that is a city and county framework um, that a lot of this health and all policies work falls under. So um, aligning with that, uh, first of all, as well as the core community impacts um, that the county has developed. So again, just looking to marry these things together for ease of use for employees. Um, and then you'll see the actual indicators and the indicator data. Um, on the far right-hand side, we have um, the current city of Santa Cruz uh, value and their current county value. And in some cases, city um, scale uh, data are not available. We would need to de default to county uh, data. And I, I think that this um, is going to be, you know, something that could evolve over time. Um, I know with the interim recovery plan, as we phase out of that over the next year, 18 months, or whatever it may be, perhaps there are some of those metrics that may be belong um, in here for looking in long term. And similarly, through the Climate Action Plan 2030 process, we anticipate that there will be some green economy metrics that come out that may be integrated into this in the future as well. So um, this is something that's adaptable um, and it's really easy to use. And then we have um, some kind of next steps that we're proposing along those five objectives that were in the original work plan. Um, we really want to expand uh, staff uh, engagement on the guidance document for the language in the agenda reports. We had 10% of agenda reports in 2020 that included um, health and all policies, and that was before we even had a guidance document. Our target for this year is 50% and for next year, 90%. And so we are looking at um, how can we expand engagement. And in fact, we um, have brought back by popular demand um, and have put on the employee training, um, in the employee training catalog for calendar year 2022, 20, uh, 
is a gender report guidance um, that will be co-taught with the um, assistant city manager and myself where we can also talk about health and all policies. So how to craft a, a cogent, concise, but informative report that includes health and all policies. Um, in terms of the, um, the framework, we brought it to you here today. Um, the implementation plan calls for reporting on that every two years. So we will do so uh, in two years uh, from now. We will bring our next annual evaluation to city council one year from now as well. Um, and in terms of training, this was something that really came up in our leadership equity workshop as um, a very high priority is that, okay, we have started to do some of this basic training around these topics, but now we need to go deeper um, into these topics. And in fact, in addition to the agenda report, we have two new trainings that are on the calendar um, for 2022 one of which I'm really excited to co-instruct with our communications manager that will be uh, best practices in equity engagement. So we are developing that right now with our Civic Spark Fellow. Um, and then lastly, supporting participation by staff and leadership in more convenings. We have not identified those convenings for this year, but we'll be doing so shortly. However, one thing that also came up in our um, equity leadership workshop was that there really was a need for community engagement that's non-project based that is solely for the purpose of relationship and capacity building. And so we really want to flesh out what does that look like? Um, and I know that our communications manager is doing a really great job of helping to connect the dots across the department on the engagement that we're doing. So we're doing it more efficiently um, and doing it with that, that equity lens, of course. And I'm really pleased. Uh, in addition to that, there are over 15 new and ongoing projects, programs, policies, and other initiatives that align with health and all policies going forward. And many of those are reinforced through the next item on your agenda, um, the uh, the uh, racial uh, 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 discrimination, uh, I'm not saying the right term, I'm sorry, but uh, the next item that's on uh, your the resolution uh, regarding the history of racism and white supremacy and actionable steps towards a more just, inclusive, safe community. I'm sorry, I wasn't sure what that was exactly called, but many of the 15 new and on ongoing projects are reinforced. For example, joining the Government Alliance for Racial Equity that would bring really great frameworks and resources to the city to be able to, again, dive deeper in training, provide tools for our employees to utilize, um, as well as the community. And that, that is my presentation for you here today. And I have the um, recommended motion on the screen, but I, I'm happy to take any comments or questions that you might have um, at this time on health and all policies. Thank, Thank you. you, Tiffany. Great, um, great presentation. I'll go ahead and look to council for comments and questions. Uh, council member Cummings, council member Watkins, and then um, council member Kalantari Johnson. Tiffany, thank you for that presentation. Um, it's good to see how this is all rolling out and um, the various policies that are aligning with health and all policies. I'm just curious, um, I know you mentioned that there's a, a number of trainings that are being offered through health and all policies, and I'm just curious kind of what metrics are being used to evaluate the kind of impact and outcomes, you know, just to understand how these trainings, um, like what kind of effect they're having, whether it's on employees, policy development, um, but really just trying to understand effectiveness of these trainings and how we measure that. Yeah, yeah thank you for that question. Um, all of these trainings do uh, post training. Uh, we ask before people leave to evaluate the training in a Likert scale kind of format. That's not something I have at my fingertips right now, um, but in general, <laughs> we saw very positive um, reception to this tra these trainings some comments on hey um, going deeper uh, and broader would be would be useful and took that to heart that's something else that came out of the equity leadership workshop and so that is why right now I'm exploring with HR what are the, the deeper um, you know kinds of trainings as I mentioned equity best practices and engagement is one of them 
that we're going to be offering. Um, and then, of course, the agenda report guidance um, is, is the second one. And then there's a third one, which I'm not recalling right now that we already have scheduled. Is Oh, that's on the Climate Action Plan 2030. We have scheduled for late 2022. And then I think we're still evaluating with HR um, what are some other next step equity ones that we can bring in um, for this year. So any any suggestions or um, you know, on topics or, or facilitators on that would be welcome. Um, this is the right time for that as HR is compiling that, um, that employee training catalog uh, for next year. Thank you. You're welcome. Council member Watkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Tiffany. I, my, I don't really have any questions, but I, I do have a couple of comments and one I just really wanna thank I want to thank you, Tiffany, for all your work on this and for really carrying this through from a concept to figuring it out with the community, with the staff, and then now to actualizing it and seeing all of the things that are listed in the table in terms of the work that we're doing is so encouraging. And knowing that this is a foundation for us to build on um, is so exciting. And I know that we have in the next item to really think about how we can support this work going forward. and. Kind of a proposal to reconvene a council subcommittee to do so, which I am very much so in support of. Um, but I also just really want to take a moment to really, um, you know, applaud the uniqueness of this being centered under our climate action manager, really recognizing that sustainability and um, the existential threat of climate change and public health and equity are so interconnected. And that is I think really forward thinking that I um, just want to take a moment to highlight because I think it's truly remarkable and I think hopefully other communities can learn from what we're doing here. Um, and we know that it's a continuous improvement process and these first steps have been really just uh, wonderful and, and deserve to be celebrated and, um, and thank you. So thank you for this report. You're welcome, council member. Council member Colin Tari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I would like to echo Councilmember Watkins' um, remarks. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for all the work you put into this. This is so impressive to see what has already taken place and what's coming. Um, I had one question around the metrics. Uh, I love seeing these metric tables. The There were two areas under community connectedness, and under safe and, or not safe, excuse me, uh, stable and affordable housing. Uh, I see that we don't have metrics at the city or county level. And I'm just wondering what um, what our plan is to, to find those indicators or to find indicators that are close to them. You know, I'll have to look into that and get back to you, um, Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. I, I'm as I'm looking at this, I realize it was about a year ago that we actually developed this, and it's really now only coming forward. And I would love to be able to consult with um, Nicole Young, our consultant who helped to prepare this, because she has a pulse on. As you know, there are some that that mentioned that there could be data coming online in the data share, and that could be these could be a couple of them. So I'd I'd love to be able to um, report back um, to you on that once I'm okay. I'm able to answer that question. Great. Well, I was impressed to see how many boxes were filled and how much data is accessible to us, and and I think you know all of this is um, makes us really ripe for additional sources of funding for the work that we're doing in our community. Uh, it's just, it's, it's really, really quite impressive what we have in place, the data we have in place. I didn't mean to point out what's missing. I was just wondering what the plan was around it because what we have in place is really quite robust and impressive. So thank you for all your work. You're welcome. Thank you. Other comments or questions from council members at this point? Okay. Um, I will take this out to public comment now. Um, so uh, this is item number 26 on our agenda, which is health and all policies, year one implementation report and fiscal year 2022, the fiscal year 2024 work plan. Um, and I will call on caller uh, ending in uh, 1810.
Uh, yeah, this is Garrett. I have spoken before of the potentially un-American aspects of the Hayat policies, declaring them as Marxist, leftist, globalist dogma. I won't repeat those here, except to repeat, Hayat is based on the false assumption that all life outcomes must be equal and or inequality itself is an injustice, which is moronic, and this justifies assigning privileges to some because of loosely correlated differences in life outcome and leads to unjustified discrimination and excessive government central control that tends in the extreme as communists clearly requiring that government must then control every aspect of people's lives to force equal life outcomes or any outcome it so chooses, citing health safety cover authority to control almost anything imaginable. A glance at your goals and community indicators page shows, for example, your concerns about fast food consumption, how fat people are, and pretty obvious leftist focuses on diversity, climate change, the sort of justice, etc. While information is helpful, just how far you intend to go violating people's individual rights and discriminate against people or businesses to achieve your goals should concern anyone who values liberty. I imagine like the let's go Brandon Patriots feel when Biden goes too far. High up itself is not concerned with American principles of liberty. Uh, just an idea. If you wanted to improve health and well-being statistics, maybe stop importing poverty here to come, uh, such as illegal aliens with sanctuary city status or uh, uh, homeless enticements, such as increasing subsidies or drug crime leniency, but instead promote outright prosperity through making businesses easier to form instead of shutting them down with misfocused, ill-considered lockdowns. I have concerns data cited to justify action goals are not simple objective measurement fact, but from observations or surveys or comes from data share, the steering committee of which are largely nonprofits and potentially less than objective oriented self-serving interests, potentially tainting the data whose existence depends on a perception of their societal need. Community assessment project data is similar. The baseline year old high up core condition status indicators also appear old or unavailable or questionable as measurement facts. It is strange for a one-year report there is no update for this incomplete year-old or more indicator list. Thanks. Thank you. Any other members of the public who wish to speak on item number 26? I, you know, we just caught that number. Anyone else? Okay. We'll bring it back to the council. Um, and um, yeah, I just very quickly make a quick comment. Um, I, you know, I just... You know, I think local government is shifting whether people want to sort of acknowledge, but um, more and more people are looking to local government for some of the things that local government didn't used to do. Um, we used to do a lot of um, pipes and uh, not as much programming, but where I think we're learning the success of our community really, really relies on, on access to local government. And I think health and all policies provides that access. So it's a, it's a very complimentary policy and set of work that I think um, really makes sense, especially now where community is wanting to understand more about how to stabilize themselves, you know, whether it's in an economic condition or a family condition or um, what have you. So Tiffany, I just want to applaud your work. So thank you for, for what you're doing and how you're operationalizing this. Um, I have Council Member Watkins uh, raised your hand and assuming you will uh, look to make a motion. Fact, I'd be happy to move um, uh, the recommendation, which is a motion to accept the Health and All Policies Year 1 Implementation Report and approve the proposed fiscal year 2022, fiscal year 2024 health and all policies work plan. Council member Kalantari Johnson. I'd like to second. Great. We have a motion on the table to accept the health and all policies year one implementation report and approve the proposed fiscal year 2022, 2024 high up work plan. Um, motion by council member Watkins, seconded by council member Kalantari Johnson. And could we have a roll call vote, please, Bonnie? Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Valentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Coming? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. Mayor Myers. Aye. That uh, motion passes unanimously. Okay, we will move <coughs> to me again. You're welcome. Um, 
We'll move on to um, our next item, which is actually item number 27, which has been removed from the agenda this afternoon. Um, so we will not be having discussion on this item. Um, Council member Cummings, I believe you had, um, I believe you might've had a statement or did you have anything to include on this today? At, we'll move on from this item. I know you had some conversations with uh, some of the community members. Yeah, no, I, and um, I think that I can save my comments for the next item since they kind of tie hand in hand. So if we can go on to the next item, I'll, I have a couple comments I'll make at that time. Okay, great. We'll move on to item number 28 now, which is um, a resolution recognizing the history and current existence of racism and white supremacy and actionable steps to work towards a more just, inclusive, and safe community. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by the council members who brought this item forward, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, I will go ahead and um, introduce Vice Mayor Bruner who will open this item. And then council member Colin Tari Johnson will follow Vice, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner and then I'll uh, have a few comments at the end. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Um, this item, really, I'd like to speak to a brief uh, background and how this came about. And um, the uh, it stems back to July, I believe, was the joint statement that Mayor Myers and myself made um, regarding uh, declaring racism a public health crisis and, and standing united to uh, be committed to anti-racism and anti-discrimination work and to take meaningful action. And um, there was a statement that we posted, it was about three paragraphs, that really um, we wanted to commit and um, part of my goal over the next year as well um, is really committing to um, ensuring that our policies and um, programs and practices um, in the city are safe and welcoming for everyone. And um, so we really wanted to um, take some of the information that we had also received from various uh, community members and um, information working um, in alignment with some of the, the information from the Health and All Policies Plan and um, tying it to action and actionable steps um, and um, committing. So we really quickly wanted to, first of all, acknowledge uh, and recognize what is happening and historically in the city and um, identify and recognize um, internal analysis and, and, and needs for where we can continue improving um, internally in the city and increasing also opportunities for leadership, opportunities for people of color and um, really trying to take, uh, um, it's what started as something very simple quickly grew to many components in this. And um, we really uh, wanted to make sure that um, we were addressing um, some really key components uh, in this resolution. So um, I will hand it over to uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson to kind of speak of that process. Thank you, Vice Mayor Bruner, and thank you for your leadership on this. Um, as Vice Mayor Bruner just stated, this this is really our commitment to action and our commitment to um, operationalizing parts of the health and all policies framework that we just heard from Tiffany's, Tiffany Wise West. Uh, we received a number of uh, correspondence from 
members of the Asian American Pacific Islander community from the black community, Latinx community. And uh, there were some specific asks in, in response to some of the hate that's been happening here in Santa Cruz, as well as across our nation, um, asks for the city to step up and, and um, again, both internally and externally respond. So we met with um, various community members from these groups uh, a number through a number of months since, I can't remember now, maybe July or August. Um, and we co-created what you see before you, the resolution that you see before you was not written by myself, Vice Mayor Bruner and Mayor Myers. It was co-created by a number of community members um, in alignment with our health and all policies plan in response to the history and current um, acts of hate and white supremacy and um, outlines a process and mechanism for us to move forward within the health and all policies framework. And I'll pass it to Mayor Myers. Thank you. And I just um, wanted to kind of forecast a little bit about sort of where this where this will sort of um, coalesce. I I hope into a community wide um, set of work and uh, hopefully um, set of events that actually again going back to our community and how they have risen up and how they have come forward. Um, the resolution also recognizes um, and promotes um, that uh, the city should become um, a regular participant and sponsor of the United Against Hate Week, which is a national effort um, born out of a, a small group uh, at, generating out of Oakland called Not In Our Town, which has done work um, nationally around speaking out against hate, um, doing trainings and really helping people understand um, how to recognize um, these kinds of trends in their community. Um, we have many local people who have come um, and contacted council and um, there's a group that is now formed um, to uh, participate and is spearheading uh, the United Against Hate Week uh, here in Santa Cruz starting next week um, uh, and running from November 14th through the 20th. We did provide a flyer and there's um, our, our, um, our uh, Elizabeth Smith, our public relations, uh, public information officer is, has, is lending um, assistance to this group to get the word out using social media as well as the city's um, websites and Facebook, et cetera. So again, this is very much uh, born out of our community. Um, we've also learned through Tiffany um, about the um, the GARE group, um, which acronym is escaping me right at this moment. But then again, this is governments against um, racism, and you know, again, looking at that local government level and providing um, tools and outreach um, in our jobs as uh, local uh, government and local leaders. Um, finally, um, we've I've reached out to we've reached out to um, as well as well as our community reaching out to us. Um, we've done outreach with other electeds as well, um, including the four other the three other mayors as well as uh, county supervisors. And I know that the county of Santa Cruz, um, the sheriff's office, our police department, um, and the three other cities, Watsonville, Capitola, and uh, Scotts Valley, have all joined. Um, in um, supporting uh, next week's events around um, around the um, United Against Hate Week. Um, and the four mayors have also issued a joint proclamation recognizing that week, as well as um, the need for continued education countywide on um, re to help reduce incidents of hate and bias and, effect and find effective ways to deal with such incidents when they do occur. So we're very um, excited about next week. Um, and uh, we just feel like things have come together really well um, and I've really enjoyed working on this resolution. And uh, we look forward to comments and questions from our colleagues. Any comments or questions as we, uh, before I take it out to, to the public? Not seeing any hands, okay. Okay, um, I will take it out to the public. Uh, this is for item number 28, the resolution recognizing the history and current existence of racism and, and white supremacy 
and actionable steps to work towards a more just, inclusive, and safe community. I see uh, Mr. Phillips, 1810, phone number ending in 1810. Go ahead, please. I, I agree racism exists in Santa Cruz. I declare the really significant racism as it exists today is what I refer to as leftist, extolling racial, perhaps hate, toward white people in the form of uttered falsehoods, acting on those falsehoods to the detriment or disadvantage or discrimination against white people. They are the real racists of today. Racism is of no consequences by itself. It matters not what people think, only what they say and do. The anti-white racism and the fabricated guise of leftist anti-racism premeditated seeks to and does generate inequities and clear evidence of the today more and to a greater detriment and risk to any and all white people, American ideals and prosperity than any other form going forward. This racism is reflected in leftist racial diversity quota systems in hiring, admission, government subsidy, affirmative action programs, race-based permits, the false rewriting of history, lowering of academic standards, the devaluing of merit, one-sided essentially falsehood-based planted race-based council resolutions and actions, reinforcement of a cancel culture directed toward anyone or thing that opposes these false narrative views, mandatory employment indoctrination and required regurgitation of such false views, inappropriate critical race theory instruction in public schools, conservative censorship in media, including local media, and here in the council's action goals of bestowed planned discrimination privilege in so many forms being promised to those by the council based solely on being any other race than white. Uh, that is pure anti-racist racism in action by you, not government, by the people, for the people. Restorative justice is a term that can only only fairly be applied to the judicial system, to actual violations of law at the time, restoration from actual living violators at the time or their estates, judged in a court, possibly restoring that which, which was then by law illegally deprived them at the time. Social justice warriors and legislative positions need civic lessons about the separations of powers in the United States. Trying to apply restorative justice outside the judicial system by enacting discriminatory, essentially ex post facto laws, disadvantaging white people is both racist and a violation of the Constitution and separation of powers assigned to the judicial system. Obama was wrong when he said diversity is our strength. It is not strength, but an obstacle to overcome, to achieve unity made even bigger by your actions. Thanks. Okay, if there's anyone else in the uh, public right now that would like to speak to this, please press star nine to raise your hand. I'm not seeing any, so I'm going to go ahead and move, uh, bring this back to council for uh, a motion and deliberation. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. And I just want to thank um, the council members who brought this item forward today. Um, and I will, I'll just start by saying, you know, I've been um, just really grateful for being on this body uh, since I've been on the city council. I'd say every year there's been, you know, numerous attempts at us trying to work together to bring forward whether they're policies, resolutions, proclamations, but really trying to promote diversity, equity, inclusion in our community and um, to acknowledge the realities that we are facing here in the city of Santa Cruz. And while I, I personally feel that Santa Cruz is a very anti-racist city, it's clear that there's still uh, work to be done and that there's still white supremacists, that there's white supremacy that exists within our society um, along with other forms of discrimination that exist. And so um, I think together we're committed as, a, as a, a body and we're committed as a community to trying to make our community more diverse and inclusive. And this is another, um, you know, resolution expressing our intent to continue to do just that. Um, I'm happy to move the, um, the recommendation forward. I was contacted and also wanted to uh, see if my colleagues would be amenable to adding a couple of bullet points to the um, last uh, portion of the resolution where, the, where we list the action items, but it would be, the motion would be to adopt the uh, resolution recognizing the historical and current existence of racism and white supremacy in the community and endorsing action steps for the city of Santa Cruz, which would also include um, bullet point one to return to the council in early 2022 with an agenda item, including any relevant analysis to declare Juneteenth a holiday starting in June 2022 for all city employees in the city of Santa Cruz. Work with the Santa Cruz Equity Collab, relevant government agencies, and other community organizations to promote and expand upon restorative justice 
in our criminal justice system and community. And third, return to council in early 2022 with an agenda item to discuss the creation of a human rights and equity commission. And so um, I know last year when um, when the when President Biden signed in Juneteenth as a federal holiday, there was a desire for us to do that in the city of Santa Cruz. And it was like, I think the day before Juneteenth. So uh, we weren't able to do so. And I know that for uh, many members of the community, they want to see this happen uh, to help celebrate the end of slavery in our country. Um, and it's also a day that we all go out, have, go out and celebrate um, our African-American community uh, this year when we being that um, when we had the celebration of the change of the name to the London Nelson Center. So that's the intent of that. Um, and then I just want to, I was going to discuss um, the next point as it relates to the item that was postponed. Um, the, the item that was before us previously was postponed largely because um, there's potential uh, legal implications for us to take a stance on a case that is in its early stages. But I think, um, you know, this resolution in particular really highlights our commitment to working uh, on restorative justice. And I know that that's something that's really important to the SC Equity Collab. And so really wanted to make sure that we included an item to demonstrate that we you know, are wanting to take action to continue working with that group and the other groups in our community on um, promoting restorative justice. And then um, I was contacted, and I know this has come up a number of times, but I think it would be worth us having a discussion about having um, creating a human rights commission and um, you know what that would take because as we're trying to address many of these issues uh, which fall under human rights and equity, it would be um, advantageous if we had another group uh, in our community that could help weigh in on that. So that's the motion and the justification behind the bullet points before you. And, um, um, and I'll just stop there. Those are all my comments. Thank you. Council members, questions or comments on the suggested uh, additions to, um, so council member, this would go in the sort of the action steps. Right. Right. Um, I just have one question about the last bullet. Um, I'm wondering um, if you would be amenable, um, you know, to possibly um, have that be a discussion with the county as well, whether a countywide human rights and equity commission might, um, I mean, I think to your point, um, I'm just wondering uh, your thoughts on that. If um, we could say return to the council in early 2022 with an agenda item to um, discuss with the county of Santa Cruz, a countywide human rights and equity commission or um, let's see here as watching as she writes, um, countywide human rights and equity commission or assessment of such a commission being um, in the city. I, the only reason being that I think so much of, you know, what I think we're learning is, you know, this, you know, that these issues cross our jurisdictions and I'm, and I'm, just wondering if maybe we explore that with our county supervisor leadership um, and then see if we back into that. Um, I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. I think that sounds like a great idea and wasn't sure to, whether to start with the city or the county, but I, I completely agree that um, taking a regional approach at this is probably most appropriate. And so I think that's a great amendment. Okay. Okay. Great. I appreciate uh, that. Mayor, can you repeat what you said after this part right here. Um, return to the, okay, to discuss um, with the county, a countywide human rights and <laughs> um, uh, and based on results of that discussion, um, develop further um, action by council. Is that okay, um, Council Member Cummings? <clears throat> that look okay to you? That looks fine. 
Okay, great. And do we have a seconder to your motion? I don't believe we have. Let me just pull up. Okay, so we have a motion with these additions. Um, right. Council member, I'll go ahead and um, call on Council Member Paul Antarian Johnson. I don't know if you were planning to do the motion on the overall resolution. I'm happy to back up. Um, but go ahead, uh, Council Member. Sure, and yeah, I, I'm happy to second. Um, I did have some questions and comments, so maybe there's for amendment. Um, thank you, Council Member Cummings, for those additions. Um, with item number two, I just want to be mindful that there are other community groups that we've been working with and that would also be interested. And I, and I see here that it says other community organizations. Um, I just want to be mindful that by naming one, we're not excluding others who would want to participate. So I don't know, that's just a thought. Yeah, that was the, I just wanted to explicitly call them out because of the previous item and they've been really wanting to work on restorative justice. So made sure to include in their other community organizations just to also not be calling out every single organization in the town, but just wanting to highlight that the SC Colab has been um, in direct communication with myself and the mayor over the past couple of days and really um, expressing that they want to work on this. So just wanted to call them out and then any other <laughs> that wants to join in, I think would be appropriate. Okay. I have a question when there's a moment. Sure. Go ahead. I had another comment, but if you wanted to jump in. Is the intent here to incorporate <laughs> these items into the resolution or is it to uh, stand alone as council uh, direction uh, ac to accompany the, the resolution? Because these could easily be incorporated into the list of bullet points beginning on page three of the resolution. <laughs> That was the intent because the um, on page three it was um, you know, a set of action steps have been identified for the city of Santa Cruz to pursue beginning in 2022, and so that was the intent is that these would be incorporated into that list of bullet points. I do have the motion language to read that. It says here with the following additional action steps. And I, I think, Bonnie, it should say and to incorporate the following additional action steps into the resolution <clears throat> and then you can continue for the city to pursue beginning in 2022. And I'm sorry, um, Mr. Rosemary, I was wondering if um, that friendly at the end of the friendly amendment, it ought to say further action uh, for council consideration. Sort of recommendation by council. Yeah, that's I, I'm fine. Develop with that. recommendations for further action for council consideration. Okay. Was that? Can we go back up to this? Tony, what was the language that you're suggesting? Uh, incorporating into the resolution. And then delete the word with, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I, I did have one more comment. If was that, are you complete, Tony? Looks like it. Okay. Um, so then on point number three, um, I just I wanted us to think about this also in the context of the health and all policies committee that that as part of this resolution we're asking to be reinstated. And I know that other communities have used their health and all policies committees as larger countywide committees that really do this work of human rights and, and equity work. So I just want to make sure we're not duplicating and that we're, and I don't know how to, how we would want to wordsmith this if, if at all, but that, that it's not exclusive of the health and all policies committee, because that could potentially, um, the work of the health and all policies committee could also be doing this human rights equity work. 
I don't know if that makes sense. So I don't know how we want to make sure that it's not duplicative and that Health and All Policies Committee is integrated into this. Does that make sense? I'm not articulating very clearly. Yeah, I guess I would just follow up to say that, um, that the commissions are usually larger community bodies, um, and it's either individuals who are appointed by the council, each council member, or they're kind of elected by council, as we'll do later with the, um, I think, sister city. So that's the only distinction between the two groups. But if the um, if the Health and All Policies Committee wanted to kind of spearhead what the creation of a human rights commission would look like, you know, maybe they could take on that role. So. I mean, I'm just saying that I think I think there are separate groups, and we would, and also if we're going to align it with the county, um, in terms of the, what the commission would be in its composition, um, you know, I think it would be good if there's a subcommittee that wants to work on that, and it's the uh, Health and Law Policies Committee. Maybe that could be something to kind of discuss with the city manager as this comes forward. Sure. Yeah, and I know that other communities, their Health and All Policies Committees are really. <laughs> There. It's countywide. It's robust. It has community, like diverse stakeholders and community input. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's potential here for us to align what's being proposed here under number three and take our health and all policies subcommittee to like a larger. You know, it. it I get very excited because I know what's been possible in other communities. So. I don't know that it needs to be added to this. I think if we uh, understand that that could that could be a place where it could live. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, thank you. I actually was also going to comment on um, number three and um, just call out that in this resolution we have directed um, that in order to accomplish, to assess and accomplish these proposals, that the council refers this to city manager's office, to the role of the health and all policies committee. And so I wonder if um, the intent of number three would fall under um, the health and all policies committee rather than a separate commission. And so I just wanted to bring that um, forward as well. Sounded like maybe the the health and all policies would be a good starting place, maybe for the city to express and sketch out kind of what this may be, and then bringing it maybe to the county as a question. You know, so maybe we do some of that work internally, and then we could bring that to the county um, to Councilmember Colontari Johnson's. You know, where health and all policies typically does kind of come out of that county county body in many many communities. Rosemary, do you have a, a comment? I just want to note that in the staff review of some of the action items on the resolution, um, HR manager Lisa Murphy did uh, identify a little bit of expanded role for the uh, existing EOC group. So I think that that's another resource that we would want to, it's, it's not a instead of necessarily, but it's another resource for bringing to the, to the fore. And I think that it's really important whenever talking about something like this, that um, you know, a new commission or or even additional work of this nature, that we that we talk really uh, clearly at the get go about what kinds of things we want it to do. I mean, I'm a big believer in form should follow function. So it's like where it where are the gaps that we want to uh, close, and then what's the right tool to uh, achieve that uh, in the most efficient, effective, and uh, you know, way that that has the biggest impact. Obviously, so so uh, you know, to the extent that we can recognize that there's a suggestion here of a of a how before we've really figured out what the what is, I would just like to make sure that that's reflected in thinking about what we're trying to do here. Thank you, Rosemary. Are we, I think we have consensus kind of on this, it sounds like, um, kind of as it's fitting together. Is that, is that right? It looks like it. Yeah. Okay. Vice Mayor Bruner, did you have any other comments? You're good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. I have Councilmember Watkins and then Councilmember Brown. 
thank you, Mayor. I'll keep my comments short. In the interest of time, I just want to you know share my appreciation to all who worked on this, and I appreciate the additions and discussion moving forward. Um, I'll just put a sort of an exclamation mark on the thought around um, kind of what the purpose would be inventory of what we already have in place or enhancement in that way um, and potential alignment with the county, um, particularly as it relates to some of the overlap between the health and all policies work that I think could ultimately or is designed to ultimately infiltrate every aspect of government and our partners to really think about equity and human rights and health and sustainability, right? So I think there is that broader kind of infrastructure that we already have in place. So having it start as sort of a discussion point for that committee to explore, I think is a really great direction at this time. And so for those reasons, I'm supportive of what we have before us. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to uh, express my uh, my support, my appreciation for the work that's gone into the thinking that's gone into this and the work that's gone into this. And, um, you know, and I do think that there is space for, um, you know, as that um, as the health and all policies committee re um, convenes and begins to talk about how to actually move take, take some some of these these um, kind of principles and and put them into you know concrete um, things we can do and actions we can take um, that also having that conversation about the potential for um, you know some kind of of body um, a human rights and equity commission city county you know I mean I, I think you know I don't have any vision exactly what that would look like but what I will say is um, that. You know, in terms of institutionally, that is that is very different than a, a three-person subcommittee of the council that uh, you know would, will sunset after some work is done. So, you know, I think that um, considering that, but I, I just want to say it here now because um, I, I'd like for the committee to hear um, that considering that is um, you know really important to think about how it is that we um, over the long haul um, are thinking about and, and operationalizing concrete actions and also how um, those are evaluated, um, not just internally with the city, but more broadly um, within our community. So I, I do think it's important um, to just recognize those as different kind of, um, again, institutionally different like organizational forms, um, a, a council subcommittee versus a, a citizens commission and, um, and think about how they might um, what, what the synergies might be and, and what the path might be forward for a longer term kind of broader uh, community um, based or, or community involved and engaged uh, uh, effort. So, um, but yeah, do really appreciate everything you all have put into this and the responsiveness to um, community concerns that have been raised. And, you know, I think there's a lot of really positive work to be done moving forward. Thank you, council member. Okay. I know we have a motion uh, on the table and I believe uh, council member Terry Johnson has seconded this motion. Are there any other comments um, by council members at this point? Okay. Um, we will go ahead then Bonnie and do a roll call vote, please. Okay. Council member Slotkin. Aye. Helen Tara Johnson. Aye. Brown. Aye. Tony. Aye. Holder. Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner. Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That uh, motion passes unanimously. Okay, we'll move on to our next item. We're running a little bit behind. Um, I'm going to try to catch up here. Um, our next item is number 29, the Sister Cities Committee appointment. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to for deliberation and action. I'll go ahead and um, uh, have Bonnie uh, give us any additional information she'd like to share on this item. Thank you, Mayor. I, we just have a vacancy on the Sister Cities Committee, and they wish to fill it ahead of the annual. They don't want to wait till <coughs> for the annual appointment. So um, we have two applicants that you guys can choose from. So if you want to um, start with the nominee. 
nomination and see we'll if anybody has a different nomination. Okay, great. Uh, Council Member Boulder. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> like, I'd like to nominate, and I think it's, it's, I think it's Kirsten, Kristen. I don't know if it's Kristen or Kirsten um, Madison, Ma Madison. Okay. And Bonnie, just remind me, do we need to second each of these, um, correct? Um, no, you would typically, you can, but you would tip before you would typically have, if someone else has another nomination and then we would go through and take a vote on each nominee. Okay. Okay, um, I'll go ahead. Um, I just have a question about her application. Um, she is not a city resident. Is that necessary um, for appointment to city uh, sister cities? I didn't get a chance to check with you about that. It is, it's not a requirement. I believe the vacancy that was on there now was not a, a city resident. So she would just be taking the county. Okay. Okay. Um, I, uh, I'm going to nominate, uh, I'm going to nominate uh, uh, Mr. Uh, let's see here, Mr. Stelling as well. So we can do a, a vote. Um, so Bonnie, well, should we hold, um, we'll do Kristen's first. And if she gets in the majority, then we wouldn't obviously vote on Mr. Stelling, but I would like to, you know, if she doesn't, how do we, yeah, is that the best way to do it? It's a little bit odd, but. Um, yeah, I can just do a roll call vote and the, <clears throat> that specific council member can just tell me out of the two who their vote is and we'll make a tally. Um, I, what I don't know if you wanna do, to see if anybody in the public wants to say anything before we get to this part. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna bring it out um, before I, before we started the vote. Um, okay. Let me just, myself back up here and um, I will go ahead and take this out to the public. Uh, this is gonna be on item number 29. This is an appointment to our sister cities committee. And if you are interested in commenting on this item, um, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand at this point in time. Anyone in the audience want to, um, okay. Not seeing any of those. Uh, we'll bring it back and we'll do we'll do the the voting. Bonnie. Okay, Councilmember Watkins. Well, I'm always, these are always so hard because it's always so nice to see people wanting to serve. Um, I think I'm going to go with. I will. I will say that we will have eventual another opening if that oh, uses your. <laughs> that does actually. So I'll go with Thomas, um, given his experience at this point. Helen Terry Johnson. Hi, yes, I'll go with Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Stelling as well. Brown? Um, I will uh, vote for uh, Kristen Mishern. Coming? No, with Thomas Stelling, just based on his experience. And, um, yep. Holder? Kristen? Vice Mayor Brunner. Kristen Mattern. And Mayor Myers. Yeah, I'm gonna go with Stelling. Um, I, I do, um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm glad we have some additional um, opportunities to do some appointments. Um, and But at, at this point, I'll go ahead and uh, go with Mr. Stelling. <coughs> Thomas Stelling is. Is, is the pick. Okay, great. Okay, uh, we will now, um, let's see, Bonnie, I'm just looking, I think we have somewhat caught up, not really though. Um, we're still running about 20 minutes behind, it looks like. Um, so let's soldier on here. An hour. What was that? Oh yeah, 20 minutes, yeah. Yeah, I think we're running about 20 minutes behind. So let's go ahead and um, keep moving. Uh, hopefully we'll get a little break. <coughs> possibly before um, before we get too much further in the... Um, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to item number 30. 
which is the ordinance extending temporary use of certain adjacent public street and outdoor areas for all eligible businesses impacted by indoor business closures related to COVID to the COVID-19 pandemic. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a, a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation. And I'll go ahead and turn this over, I think, to Rebecca or Bonnie, I'm not sure which. Um, is it going to be you, Bonnie? I'm just going to, thanks, Mayor, and I'm just going to briefly introduce the item and then turn it over to Rebecca, our Economic Development Manager. Um, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context in that we came to you um, in August, um, you know, a couple months ago um, with a recommendation to extend the emergency ordinance um, for businesses for outdoor dining for a year. And at that meeting, um, you directed us to come back and um, specifically um, we, working with the city attorney's office, we have a regular ordinance to extend the previous um, emergency ordinance for a year. So it would go through, it currently expires in this, at the end of December this year. Um, we now have a regular ordinance extending that emergency ordinance that will go through next December of 2022. Um, also in the August 24th, um, meeting, you directed us to specifically look at options for the 1100 block um, for the following year. We um, have done a, quite a bit of outreach um, and heard both concerns and benefits and um, do have a recommendation to open the 1100 block as soon as possible in 2022, um, but to work with ex all the existing businesses on that block to make sure that those that have outdoor expansion areas um, can continue to operate those and um, to reopen that as, as soon as possible. Um, Rebecca will go into quite a bit more detail. I just wanted to provide that context um, before she starts her presentation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Excellent, thank you very much, Bonnie. And good afternoon, Mayor and City Council, uh, Rebecca Unit, Economic Development Manager for the City of Santa Cruz. Um, so this, oh, excuse me, my course, having Zoom issues. Uh, so the item today, uh, as we mentioned, is an update uh, and a um, introduction of an ordinance to extend our current temporary outdoor dining program uh, through the end of 2022. Um, so we have prepared a regular ordinance uh, to extend this program. Um, the uh, reason we're bringing forward this regular ordinance instead of just extending our emergency uh, ordinance that we had in effect previously is that um, as we're all fairly aware, um, a lot of the pandemic related conditions and restrictions have been eased. Um, we are still very much in recovery mode and, um, and still in a pandemic, but um, the emergency nature that we initially enacted this program under is slightly lessened. Um, and as we moved in, move into the new year, having this regular ordinance in place is just gonna give us a little bit more security in continuing this program forward. Um, and then I also wanted to just mention, um, since we have met uh, last in August to give an update on this program, we've been doing outreach to the existing uh, temporary permit holders to get an understanding of whether or not they want to continue in the next year with their temporary per with their temporary permits, um, as well as getting an understanding of if they want to move into a permanent uh, program once we have those details in place. So we've been doing a lot of outreach with our 97 uh, permit holders and have just over half of them uh, responded to, but we know that they're very busy business owners. So we're continuing to do that outreach to follow up with them, and make sure that we get in touch and every bit uh, get in touch with every business. Um, and so uh, this ordinance will just give us that continuation of the current operations that we have for that program, no additional changes uh, of what we're um, allowing under that operation. Um, and then as Bonnie mentioned also at our last meeting, we wanted to bring back a recommendation for the 1100 block of, of Pacific Avenue. Um, currently we have a full street closure on this block. So this is the stretch of Pacific Avenue between Cathcart Street and Lincoln Street, um, and uh, right now, this is the one-way northbound uh, stretch of Pacific Avenue, and we have several businesses that have expanded onto uh, the street closure. Originally, when we first started the street closure uh, back in the summer of 2020, um, businesses were able to just set up some chairs and tables in the streets, 
Um, it was, you know, a much more sort of open environment. Um, and as the pandemic has gone on and um, just the need to adapt and sort of bring in more infrastructure, businesses have built out some of these platforms that you see in this image here. Um, and with that, you know, the use of the space has sort of changed over time, um, but it's still been a great area for uh, events, activations, and different things. Um, we've heard quite a bit of different opinions about how this space has been used and sort of the success of the street closure over the last, um, you know, just over a year that we've had it in place. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of outreach uh, about sort of what we want to see in this space going forward. Um, initially in 2020, when we first had uh, the street closure in place, we did have a meeting with the Downtown Association. Um, the executive director of the Downtown Association pulled together a group of stakeholders from the 1100 block, um, as well as some other businesses that are just on the boundaries of that area to talk about sort of what people were thinking about the space, if they were liking the closure, how it was impacting them. Um, and there was really a mixed bag of opinions there. Um, and then when, uh, so we continued on and had the street closure um, and moved forward. Um, and as we've sort of gone through our full year of, uh, or I guess um, almost two years now, <laughs> of uh, having this space in effect, um, we have uh, heard a lot more rumblings around um, impacts to different groups. And so um, we've spoken with some of the, uh, we've spoken again with the neighboring businesses on the 1100 block, as well as those off the 1100 block, um, and have talked with some of the event producers um, and we've also heard feedback from the residents that live on that stretch. Um, some of the major themes that we've heard from this feedback is um, that people really like having more space for dining, seating, pedestrian access. Um, they really like having that events, uh, enhanced event area when it's programmed well. Um, but we've also heard that there are some impacts to residents who maybe have mobility issues uh, because that street is closed. They're not able to have their ride drop them off directly in front of their building. Uh, one of the residential buildings on that block has their elevator access only on Pacific Avenue. And so that's really challenging for some of those residents who are needing to get much closer access or get deliveries to their to their residents. Um, and then we've also had other businesses who aren't, you know, a restaurant or, or a retail business that really rely on having that customer experience and having their customers being able to um, access their business close uh, to the parking. And so they've had issues with reduced uh, customer parking. Um, and then we've also heard from businesses off of the 1100 block Pacific Avenue that have had um, the feel that their impacts their business in terms of the traffic flow being cut off to them um, because this is that one way stretch that goes north on Pacific Avenue. Um, it's, it, you know, it sort of changes the traffic pattern for them. Um, and so with that, um, we talked internally as well to see if there was maybe a different configuration or a way to do sort of a partial closure or on a weekly or a monthly basis or um, if there are other options for us um, to keep that going in some fashion and really with the um, capacity and sort of the, the demands of the different users, it really makes the most sense to just reopen the block. Um, and then we would also be able to allow those businesses that are currently operating their outdoor dining spaces to continue that use, but reopen it for um, the other uses that need access on that space. So. Um, if we do move forward in this uh, direction, as we're recommending, we would work in early January 2020, uh, 2022 to uh, reopen and work with those businesses that are currently operating on the block to make some changes to their outdoor dining. Some of them expand into the uh, drive lane on Pacific Avenue, so we need to reduce their expansion areas down um, and then bring in the additional safety barriers that we need to, to make them safer through traffic. And so we'll be working with those businesses and we've already started that outreach to them to let them know um, and talk through those logistics. Um, and so our recommendations today for you are uh, to introduce for publication an ordinance, extending emergency ordinance number 2020-27 authorizing temporary use of certain adjacent public street and outdoor areas for all eligible businesses impacted by indoor business closures related to the COVID-19 pandemic until December 31st, 2022. And our second recommendation is to direct staff to work with businesses operating outdoor expansions on the 1100 block of Pacific Avenue to modify these spaces for continued use with through traffic to allow for reopening of the 1100 block of Pacific Avenue as soon as possible in 2022. 
and I will take any questions. Thank you, Rebecca. Great report, and um, thank you for doing all that outreach with the uh, with the with the neighborhood, especially. Uh, I know we got some communications from folks. Uh, Councilmember Cummings, did you have questions? I have uh, three pretty short questions. Um, thank you for that presentation, by the way, to Rebecca and all the work that you all have done to help support the businesses with outdoor dining uh, during this time. Um, and I just do want to, I, I do want to say, I think you highlighted something that I hadn't really thought about, which was the fact that, you know, for some people who are maybe elderly or have mobility issues, you know, the fact that they can't, they have to get dropped off at the end of a block and then have to walk in, that can be challenging for some folks. Um, so that was something that I hadn't thought of that I'm glad you brought up. I was just curious, um, one, my first question, you mentioned that there's some businesses that operate that need parking outside of their business. And I was just curious if you could give an example of what that is, because I just think about retail and um, restaurants, but if there's other types, I'm just curious what an example of that would be on that block. Yeah, so we do have some service businesses on that block. Um, so there's an optometrist office there. Um, and, you know, there's, that's, yeah, the optometrist office, you know, requires, they have customers that are coming for appointments um, and some of their clientele are older as well and, you know, might have mobility issues that they really benefit from having potentially available on-street parking there um, that's completely cut off right now. Great. Um, the next question I had, <laughs> is there, um, and so um, a number of folks who have benefited from the outdoor dining have been asking about, like, how can they get going on trying to create, you know, permanent so that they can, uh, permanent outdoor seating so they can start, you know, making preparations now, whether it's, you know, saving money or getting loans or what have you. And so I'm just curious kind of where things are at with that and and um, in terms of like the process for people to have permanent businesses or outdoor. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that question. So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've you know done we've been starting the outreach to them. So we have a form uh, that we've sent out in emails to all of our permit holders, and we've been doing some follow up with them. Um, and basically, the first step that we're really trying to get businesses to do is fill out that form and let us know um, yes that they want to extend into next year for the temporary, and then yes or no if they want to go permanent. Um, and so that's you know sort of us logging that data, and then. Um, we have also started looking at for those that, that have filled out that response um, on the private property side of things, we have been working with planning to do an internal review of um, what it would take for those businesses to go permanent. So looking at sort of what's their site plan, what would their parking requirements and permit requirements be under our codes currently um, to do that analysis and see, you know, is there an easy path for them or are there some things that we maybe want to look at from a policy um, perspective to ease that going forward. Um, so we're doing a lot of data collection on that. And then on the um, public sector or the public property side of things for parklets, um, we are working with a landscape architecture firm right now. We're trying to get our uh, agreement in place to um, work on some um, plan set designs with them as well as have them help us um, with our design guidelines of what the um, new platform requirements would be. Um, and so we're hoping to have that early 2022 as well um, to get those going. Uh, so we have quite a few businesses that are reaching out um, that are you know, trying to make plans as they go forward. Um, and so really the best step is to have them uh, check in with me and, and my colleague Nathan uh, to talk through sort of where they're at in the process and what their specific needs are. And we can see what information we can provide now and then give them sort of the information we have uh, about what's coming down the pipeline and, and when those next steps are going to come. Great. And is there an update that might uh, happen with city council at a future meeting that we could uh, we'll let people know about for that process? Yeah, we don't have one scheduled um, as of, yeah, I know this was sort of our next um, time, but we can definitely bring something back um, in January, Bonnie, I'll let you talk about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, just to add to that, we could, yeah, bring something back, as, as Rebecca suggested, in January. We could um, do a, a little deeper dive as part of a, a, our interim recovery plan quarterly update, one of the items um, associated with that as well. And I just wanted to add to Rebecca's comment about sort of next step and process, um, particularly uh, for the downtown businesses. 
and she mentioned the landscape architecture firm that we're working with and part of what we're doing and, and the reason for the form and the follow-up individually is we wanted to give um, businesses options of looking at if you have an outdoor expansion now um, you could look at that and say okay this is the minimum that's going to be required to make this permanent if that's if that is an option that you want to do the sort of the the least expensive option to make it compliant for permanence and then also with the landscape architecture looking at we're trying to come up with some uniform standards and an option of sort of like a template of um or a model of a uniform standard for the downtown for some of these businesses and we're also looking at and this would be something that would come forward to you at a future point of potential grant funding to offset the cost of that if they want to go down that route versus just the minimum to make it permanent so we want them to have options for those that are just like you know I, I you know I don't want to spend a lot of money I just want it permanent versus those are like I want something you know really nice and I want to invest that but I don't necessarily have the full funds for that and I want to see what options the city might provide so we're trying to be able to provide some guidelines as well and so that's what we're working with the landscape architect on as well so doing individual assessments of each um, particularly downtown outdoor expansion area great well thank you all for all your hard work on this I know a lot of people in the community appreciate it any other questions from council members on this item Okay, I'll go ahead and bring this item out to the public then. Uh, we are on item number, let me just grab my notes here, 30, um, excuse me, <clears throat> on item number uh, 30, which is the ordinance extending temporary use of certain adjacent public street and outdoor areas for all eligible businesses impacted by indoor business closures related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, if you wish to speak to this item, please press star nine on your phone now. Uh, that will raise your hand. And when we see that, we'll be able to put your name. And so I'm looking for our media attendees to feel uh, welcome to do that. I am not seeing any hands come up. Uh, um, I'd like Mayor to say, yeah. yes. Uh, I was going to say, Peter is on the line. He may have to do an announcement in Spanish to see if there's anybody. Got it. For him to translate. Great. Go ahead, Peter. Oh, thanks. Hello, City Council. Thanks, uh, City Mayor. Uh, actually, um, what I have is, I guess your uh, yeah, Rebecca definitely did a good work spreading a word on this resolution. It reached Beach Flat, and for those who don't know me, I'm Peter Bichie, the community liaison for the City of Santa Cruz. And David Torres uh, reached me, uh, unfortunately, at this time. He is busy. He cannot be here directly, but he wanted to, uh, he was definitely thinking of the first parcel resolution because obviously he's in Beach Flat, not on the Pacific Avenue. But for him, uh, it really has told me that this has been a really had saved his business basically last year when they opened the outdoor part. And basically he wrote me in Spanish. Uh, he was saying, um, let's see. Um, so he says last year he lost 80 percent and of course i'm translating he wrote me in spanish and i'm reading but i don't think there is point of reading it in spanish unless you want me to tell to but otherwise i'm just translating as i read it 80 percent of his uh of uh, his uh, business went down from last year uh, but then having this little roof and having this little extra outdoor helping immensely and uh he would definitely have to have it like to have it renewed for the 22 and permanently would be also ideal. He says he create a little different atmosphere outdoors and a lot of his customers also like to go in and eat outdoors and just so it opens up not only when we allowed some of the eatings inside, but also outdoors. And he says that even pre pandemic, he had always had a dream to have a little bit like downtown, like Pacific Avenue, have these little outdoor areas because you know he's in close to the boardwalk, the majority of all his uh, uh, clientele is affiliated with the boardwalk so when it's open people go from the beach or to the parking lot and from the river and they just walk by there and now having several uh, areas where you know they can eat outdoors it helps a lot and having a little music there so he says that he please uh, support his resolution and hope he hopes that in the, you know, at some point it will be uh, permanent and that uh, he really appreciate the help in that and thanks Great, for thank listening you Peter for for passing that on I'll look to see if there's uh, any other hands up in the um, attendees? I'm not seeing any, so I'll go ahead and bring this back to council for deliberation. Council member Cummings. 
Yeah, I'll just move the staff recommendation. Okay, and Council Member Brown. I will second that. Great. Okay, we have a motion on the table to um, extend this emergency ordinance uh, for outdoor um, uh, uh, dining areas until December 31st, 2022. Um, this motion introduces um, the ordinance for publication and directs staff to work with businesses operating outdoor expansions on the 1100 block of Pacific Avenue to modify these spaces for continued use with through traffic to allow for reopening the 1100 block of Pacific Avenue as soon as possible in 2022. And uh, ordinance number is 2020-20. Um, okay, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote, please. Mm -hmm. Council Member Watkins. Aye. Helen Tari Johnson. Aye. Brown. Aye. Cumming. Aye. Holder. Aye. Vice Mayor Bruder. Aye. Mayor Meyer. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, we will go ahead and keep moving. Um, we're going to go on to item number 31, which is the collective of results and evidence-based, evidence um, otherwise known as core investments update regarding request for proposals and next steps discussion and additional core funding and deferral of the annual, annual of the core annual report. And um, I will have uh, Laura Schmidt, our assistant city manager, make a presentation today. We'll be um, receiving the presentation from the staff and then we will um, see if there's any questions from uh, council and then I'll take it out to public comment after those questions and then we'll come back for deliberation and action. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Mayor. I would also like to um, welcome Randy Morris, who's on the call. I think you can see him in one of the tiles. Randy is the human services director from the County of Santa Cruz. And he will be our resident expert on CORE helping me out this evening. So thanks, Randy, very much for joining us. Uh, today, we're going to um, the follow up to a conversation that we had with you on September the 28th. And during that council meeting, you agreed to the three year uh, new term for this RFP time span, as well as a hybrid tiered funding approach um, with one deeper investment called a target and impact tier as well as um, transitioning our $45,000 in city funding to, um, and the language of that is to spread it across base funding. And we're going to have a little bit of a conversation regarding that later. Today, what we're gonna take you through is an update of what's been going on since September 28th. We're hoping that you will approve the release of the request for proposal that you will direct us to return back to you in March um, for a checkpoint um, prior to the rating panel and just do a general update. And then we also want you to specify the $45,000 and are set aside to potentially go to the target impact tier based upon a recommendation from our community programs committee and then possibly um, ad address additional funding requests to that targeted impact tier for the city and then uh, agreed uh, that the county is going to defer the yearly core report no, to lo no later than December of 2022 to include a final five-year report. And um, that's all, just that little bit. Um, and just as a reminder, all of these actions and the slides that you'll see, except for the couple that are specifically related to our investment, are in alignment with what the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors approved earlier today. So just a heads up on that piece of it. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. Are you able to see slides? Yes, we are, Laura. Great, thank you. I'm gonna reset the, my, my tiles so I can Brady bunch you guys and see you. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna talk and give you an update on the timeline and kind of context you where we are in the process and give you a review of some stakeholder engagement that has happened since September the 28th, discuss 
um, the important details of the core RFP, which is included in your agenda packet and summarize our next steps. So the timeline, um, we presented a framework for you in the fall and that was the end of September meeting here at the county or at the city. And then we also had a parallel meeting at the Board of County Supervisors as well. And today we are here to um, ask you to release the draft request for proposal that's included in your packet. There'll also be some technical assistance work that the team will be doing with potential applicants. And then in the winter of 21 into the early part of 2022, we'll be receiving the proposals from the applicants with the final deadline being February 4th of 2022. And then in the spring in March, um, and this is one of the potential directions that you'll give us is for us to return back to you with a status report on the application process and how that's going. The panels will review the applicants and it, there'll be recommendations of awards. And for us, that, th those funding conversations happen in our May budget hearings. And then you all do a final uh, budget adoption, usually in the first meeting in June for us. And we'll then uh, um, adjourn in July. And then in July of 2022, so that'll be fiscal year 2023 for us, the actual contracts would begin. The team is doing a lot of work with Nicole Young and Nicole Levin, as well as various county staff to um, do engagement with stakeholders. I've not participated in this, but they've, um, they've worked with the Community Foundation and the Seniors Council. And then there was a comprehensive um, October 19th stakeholder engagement session, as well as a follow-up survey that went out to potential applicants. And there is a summary document in your packet as well related to the results and the feedback from the October 19th meeting. The key takeaways from that meeting um, that the many of the questions that the potential applicant pool had were around operationalizing equity in the RFP and how that would happen and how the proposal review would happen in the scoring and then the um, funding award decisions and the criteria related to that. And you will see um, a really great amount of detail of that, of all these questions answered in the actual content of the request for proposal that is included in your packet. Just a reminder of the tiers that you approved at the end of September, um, the small, medium, large, and for the first time, the targeted impact tier. And then for us um, on this item, we had specifically requested that the 45,000 be spread across the base. But when we had a conversation with community programs committee, um, we, they thought that the intention needed clarification. And then rather than spreading our $45,000 across the small, medium and large tier, the community programs committee wanted to clarify that with the larger council and recommend that it specifically go into the targeted impact so that the city could participate in that um, tier of the process. So that would combine the county's 750,000 with our 45,000 to be a $795,000 award. So this is, this is, but these are the slides that are unique to the city that the Board of Supervisors did not consider. So one of the things that we'll talk about at the end of the presentation is um, whether or not you wish to direct staff to focus all of the 45,000 into targeted impact rather than distributing it across small, medium, and large tiers. And then additionally, um, the Community Programs Committee recommended that the council consider it additional funding for the targeted impact up to 55,000 in addition to the 45,000 for a possible total of up to 100,000 for a city contribution into targeted impact. A lot of numbers. Okay, so going back to the RFP, who can apply? Um, nonprofits, 501c3s, including faith-based organizations and grassroots groups with nonprofit fiscal sponsors. Uh, public education agencies and uh, collaboratives with identified lead agencies as well as federally recognized tribal agencies are all um, available to apply. What is core funding for? So for the small, medium and large tier grants, uh, they're direct service programs or projects that address 
the various core conditions, and the core conditions is the is the circular model at the beginning of the presentation. The targeted impact grant is for a collective impact uh, to approach improving conditions for equitable well-being across the core conditions. So the key word there, I believe, is equity. But also continues the focus on direct services, and it may include capacity building for systems, communities, and organizations as well. So what are the application and award parameters? Uh, there's no limit on the number of proposals per applicant, but the funding request for an applicant is not to exceed 25% of the total for funding that we saw in the previous tables. Uh, you cannot apply for the same program or project in multiple tiers of our proposals. So if that program or project is a medium tier proposal, you can't deploy it into small and large as well. And then the administrative rate that you can ask for reimbursement is up to 15%. And then the award amount will be within 10% of the, of the amount that you, the applicant requests. The support that the applicants will have during this process, there'll be a request for proposal informational session once the RFP is approved. There'll be group workshops um, our consultants will have some formal office hours to lend specific support to applicants, and there'll be individual technical assistance sessions, and then there'll be Q&A uh, for a two-month window with rolling responses, so the applicants will be able to um, basically the same RFP process that you normally go through as far as asking questions and getting information back from the county and city. As far as the actual responses and the review and the panel process to support that. Uh, we're going to recruit locally as much as possible and um, build a pool of diverse reviewers across all of the core conditions. They're going to recruit and select reviewers with an equity lens and provide training to reviewers, which is always helpful. Uh, in a nutshell, the next steps, the RFP, Hopefully it is approved tonight. It's gone through the approval process at the Board of County Supervisors and it will get released on November 16th. The proposal responses are due from the applicants on February the 4th of 2022. We'll report back to you as directed by you in March of 2022. In May of 2022, during our um, budget hearings for the city, we'll get recommended awards. That'll be part of our budget packet to you. And then in June, as budget is adopted, that will be the um, culmination of the final decision and our funding for the fiscal year. And then the new pro pro contracts um, start in July of 2022. For the council, um, what we have for your recommendation to take action on tonight is receive the update, approve the release of the core RFP, direct us to return back to you in March with a status report on the core applicants submitted and subsequent rating panel process, to fold the $45,000 set aside into the core's targeted impact tier, and that's a recommendation from the Community Programs Committee, uh, direct the CPC to return back to council with future discussion and recommendations as to the funding, if the funding picture changes and defer the core annual report. The asterisk on the proposed recommendation number four, we would need to insert additional language there. If the council decides this evening to um, add any additional funds for the budget of $45,000 to increase our contribution to the targeted impact here, we'd have to adjust that language. And um, with that, I turn it over to uh, Randy, if there are things that I didn't emphasize or you would like to add additionally, I'd be more than happy to have you comment to the council, though I will hand it over to them for any questions that they may have. Um, thank you, Laura. It's good to see all of you. And again, I look forward to seeing you in person someday. <laughs> um, I think there's two things that might be helpful based on what I heard you speak about when I was um, your county partner on September 28th. The first is um, just to want to say a touch more about the Community Foundation. Mayor Myers, you um, expressed hope that we'd be able to develop some partnership and leverage some of their funding. So I just want to share a touch more 
that we have had active collaborative discussions with the community foundation. Um, we have committed together city, county and community foundation to talk at the time the core applications are in hand and the community foundation grant applications, which are released in January are in hand. And at that point to review whether or not we have some overlapping um, application where it might make sense to marry funding then. So we sort of collaboratively agreed to, to that it was premature to have any party commit to giving the other party some money when the RFP is released, but that's not because we're not committed to looking at what's in hand together um, in, in the spring. So I just wanted to make sure that was known. Um, and then the other is I want to say I have not discussed what I'm about to share with um, Laura or Rosemary, but I hope it makes sense. Um, given the, the decision you have in front of you from your program committee and thinking about how and in what way to apply your city money, one of the reasons we recommended to the board that we come back in March is because that's before the rating panels meet and we will have the applications in hand. So part of what we're hoping bringing forward to the county board and to your council is sort of an aggregate summary of what's in hand, at which point there's another opportunity for both legislative bodies to give new and refined direction to um, the county and the city. So I, I imagine that might be a moment where if this is a controversial, complicated issue, you still have another opportunity to be very directive about where you want your money to be applied with some more information because we'll know what applications we have in hand and sort of where the areas of uh, interest are from the applicants. So I hope that's helpful as well. And I'm here for questions and answer when, when and if appropriate. Thank you, Randy, that is very helpful. Great. Does that conclude the presentation, Laura? You guys are available for questions? Yep, we'll hand it back to you, Mayor. Thank you, that was great. Um, any questions from city council members at this point? I'm not seeing any questions. I, I have one question um, on the asterisk um, in that motion, Laura, my understanding is the 45,000 is already to set aside. Um, so that would be, that is um, basically, you know, being referred to go into this, into the new system in the, in the agenda report or, or the way it was noticed, it says 45,000 to 100,000. So if we wanted to go to that 100, we have to approve that extra 55,000, is that right? Correct, you already approved the 45,000, but the motion language on September the 28th mentioned um, spreading it across the base, whereas the CPC would like the council to consider keeping the 45,000 at a minimum and put it toward targeted impact. And then should the council desire on top of that, allocate additional up to 55,000 in budget. Now, the timing of this core agenda item is a little bit interesting because next you will hear the financial status update. And ideally it might have followed the financial status update because that is a, obviously a financial decision that you would be making. But um, we needed to juggle and also um, take into account that we had county agency staff also participating in this and possibly they may not um, be used to our late evening sessions, so. Thank you, thank you for that clarification. Um, that was my one question. Uh, Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Brown. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on the mayor's question. Um, so with this, like if we, for example, allocate that 45,000 and if we decide to increase the amount and allocate an additional 55,000, is that just one time or is that, are we kind of providing direction that that's something we want to do every year? So I'm just, I just want to make sure that's clear that if we, whatever we're doing, that it's kind of a, is it one time or is it kind of, we're, we're saying that we want to move in this direction moving forward. I, I believe minimally since on September 28th, council bought into that this was a three year program. Minimally council should make the commitment to whatever it is for the three years of the program. Okay. So that, would be, that would be my understanding of what the intention would be. <laughs> okay, so yeah, if we, if we decided to, to add an additional 55,000, that would be on, that would be those combined additions for, for at least three years. Correct. Okay. And then um, the last question I had, 
Um, just wanting to know um, who applicants in the city should contact if they want to apply for these funds. Um, Laura, do you want me to share a little bit about that? Yes. I, I didn't look specifically in the RFP who the contact information is, but. Yeah. So we, we the county human services department are going to, you know, pending your city council approval <laughs> on top of the board's approval this morning, I'm going to spend the next week preparing to release the actual application, opening an online portal and initiating a lot of um, communication with the community which will include information on our county human services website and also some so social media outreach and reaching out to our email group of all the stakeholders. So there'll be ample information out and in there will be contact information. And I'm being really honest, I actually myself don't know <laughs> what, but, what, but those materials are all in draft and ready to go. So it'll be a public uh, in a week. Okay, yeah, I was just asking because, you know, if we're in communication with nonprofits, that would, would be a good fit for this funding and or people start asking us questions, just being able to direct them, whether it's the county or the city and, you know, certain websites or what have you, just being able to know where to kind of direct people. Yeah, and I would just say to get more targeted because you get a million emails and questions and all that stuff is there was a quick summary on Laura's slides that came from slides we presented this morning where there's gonna be a series of engagements between <laughs> and the application deadline in early February, which includes a mandated um, RFP informational session. So I think the first place to move people to, and that's likely where we'll be moving people to is go to the session where there'll be a public communication. Uh, we also have a question and answer period that we'll manage in the county in concert with you as the city. So there'll be multiple places to send people where the playing, we want the playing field to be even. We don't want anybody to get a different answer because they know somebody. So we're trying to be very open and transparent and have the communication flow. And if people miss something, things are posted so they can see the questions and answers. So all of that will be in the materials. Great, thanks. And then I just one um, comment. Can, council member Cummings, um, also in the attachment, and this will this will be available online once the RFP is published, but in section five, it details out. It'll have the okay. link to the portal that Randy, where the dead, all the deadlines, where to send information, <laughs> that sort of thing. So like, as you said, there's an, there'll be ample information and links out there for them. Great, thanks. And then, Sorry, council member Cummings. Oh, no, that was, that was I appreciate it. And then just one more comment, um, kind of following up on item 30 that we had with the resolu resolution at recognizing historical and current existence of racism and white supremacy in the county. Um, part of the actions was really trying to connect with um, communities of color to these kinds of resources. So it might be good if there's some targeted approach from the city to try to get these this information about this out to, directly to nonprofits that are run by um, people of color and people who are people who are typically underrepresented in um, uh, getting funding for these kinds of opportunities. We can um, definitely follow up on that and uh, moving forward, our, our staff lead, our representative to the core investment team will be Dr. Tiffany Wise West. She will bring that bridge to the sustainability program and the health and all policies and the equity aspects. Um, oh. And I think that linkage of her work to CORE is essential. And it's great that we're going to be able to leverage her um, with the larger CORE team that's out there. Great, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. I just lowered my hand. I was um, going to try to help clarify if we didn't get there, but I think I think yeah. we did. So I'll, I'll just reserve my okay. comments for um, but before we take a vote. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'll go ahead and bring this out to the public now. If you are interested in um, commenting on this item, we are on item number 31, collective of results and of evidence-based core investments update regarding requests for proposals and next steps, discussion of additional core funding and deferral of core, core annual report. And we'll look to see if we have any folks who have raised their hands in the audience on this. If you do wanna uh, comment on this item, I'd like you to raise your hand by pressing star nine on the phone. 
Okay, I'm not seeing any um, hands raised, so we will go ahead and um, bring this back for council deliberation and action. Uh, council member Golder and then council member Colin Tari Johnson. I'm happy to move the item as it's written in our agenda. And council member Colin Tari Johnson. Thank you. I can second, but um, also had some comments. I wanted to first thank uh, Randy Morris and Human Services Department and um, everyone on that team for the work that you've done to, to get this here. And I also wanted to acknowledge and thank Laura who jumped into this and um, really took it on. And this is really a lot of years in the working and, and you came in and, and, and just understood it really quickly and you were able to engage in a uh, really meaningful and thoughtful conversation with the community programs committee. So I wanted to just thank everyone. And um, just a note on this commitment to the the, the impact, targeted impact strategy that, that this is really a best practice in the world of philanthropy. And um, communities that have done this have seen greater results and outcomes. And I think that um, 45,000, although not a lot, it's a start for us to show our commitment towards seeing results and outcomes. And, and that's why the community, and I won't speak for everyone um, in the community programs committee, but that's that's why we're bringing this forward as a recommendation is that we at least start with the 45,000 set aside, which again, as a set aside, it was already designated for uh, funding for these community programs but that we move it towards this targeted impact because this is a best practice. We're giving it a try, we're trying it on as a community and it's a good place for us to contribute. Um, if there is funding available for us to increase it to 100,000 so that it's about 10% of our base funding, that would be great. But I think that does require further uh, analysis and consideration. <laughs> So again, thank you for all the work to um, everyone who's done done the work on this in the last probably over a year. Thank you, Council Member um, Council Member Watkins. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor, and I'll just echo um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson's comments as a core uh, committee member myself. I really appreciate the work that went into getting us to this place. Um, Really thanking Randy for being here with us, the county and the city for partnering in this way, and and really optimistic to hear that the community foundation is now also part of the conversation, because ultimately, if we don't lose sight of what the bigger picture is, which is essentially how are we creating these safety nets and how are we thinking of it through a lens of collective impact, um, you know, we'll miss sort of this broader trajectory of change we seek to have an impact on, and um, it's nice to know that we're continuing to modify and engage and refine as we did with this process as as you all did really as staff with this process to get us to this place i think it's really great um just really sharing also the echoing of the 45 set aside really that has been kind of in place to meet immediate needs and having it fit within this um this framework and this within these parameters makes a lot of sense and um certainly looking forward to the conversation around whether that could be increase depending on our kind of our financial considerations. So um, lastly, I will just say, uh, I'm really also excited to have Tiffany Wise West uh, support this committee moving forward. I think she's gonna be a really great um, asset as well. So happy to support the motion as presented. Thank you, council member. I have council member Brown and then council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I would echo the comments of my colleagues on the Community Programs Committee. Uh, thank you uh, to both of you for um, being really, really deeply involved in this process and, and very thoughtful about how we move forward. And, and thanks to Laura and to Randy and the, you know, everybody who's been involved. We have, um, you know, some awesome uh, support uh, to help help guide us in how we make our decisions. And um, so, and I'm happy to support this as well. Um, I did wanna just make a comment about the discussion we had around the potential to increase the um, $45,000 amount to um, potentially up to $100,000. So the additional uh, 55,000 for 
the um, targeted targeted um, deeper deeper investment. Um, so a couple of things come to mind. First, I mean, I just just to put this in historical context, uh, the city of Santa Cruz has been uh, a supporter of nonprofit community programs for many, many years. We, you know, I think in as in many arenas, we are a pioneer in, um, you know, really stepping up and, and being um, engaged with our community, our nonprofit community partners. And, um, you know, and we so we've maintained that commitment and um, over time that funding has uh, diminished. And I, I think I've said it before, but just to give you a sense, you know, 20 years ago, the city invested $3 million in community programs. And so it has been a significant reduction over time um, for a variety of reasons that, um, you know, fiscal fiscal challenges at the city. And we're facing one right now again. And so I understand the concern about, um, you know, making motions that involve um, potentially allocating additional dollars. So, um, you know, while I, I don't uh, you know we the community programs committee didn't uh, ultimately decide to recommend that today. Um, we did talk about the importance of uh, potentially increasing that uh, that commitment in that category um, because we want to be a full participant. And um, you know, I, and I know we will still have a you know we'll have a voice and we'll be involved. But um, you know, to to really make that a meaningful commitment. So um, I'm just wondering if, um, you know, I don't know that it need, needs a, you know, for amendment to the, the motion, but I'm just, I'm just hoping that we can um, agree to um, bring that back and incorporate that into our budget discussion um, to make sure that that does not get lost in the gloom and doom that um, I, I believe we are about to um, hear more about. Um, so I don't know if, you know, like how that just like logistically, um, practically, how that, um, how we make sure that that is kind of comes back to us without providing that, you know, formally in a motion. Is that, um, I guess, Laura, I would ask you, um, having been, you know, helped us staff this uh, for the, in the in the recent past, um, is that something that um, will just there's some, there will be some continuity and it will it will end up being part of the discussion based upon the conversations we've had or do you want us to provide direction? I think item number five can be that direction because it okay. directs the CPC to return back to council with future discussion and recommendations as the funding picture changes okay. and. Funding picture is a, is a direct line of sight to the budget. I think the other um, the other fail safe that you have is Tiffany is part of the city manager's office, and I'm part of the city manager's office, and we're the ones that propose um, the the budget. And core is part of that budget that the city manager's office proposes as part of our um, participation in the budget hearing. So I I think. The item number five is your is your line of sight back to the council, and then as you meet as the community programs committee, this could be an ongoing conversation that you have. Oh, great, great! Yeah, I just so that general number five um, kind of return with future for or future discussion would cover that. Okay, great. I think it would it would if you're comfortable with it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Great. Councilmember Cummings? <coughs> Sorry, I think um, my question was just answered with the comments from Councilmember Brown. I was going to ask if uh, Councilmember Golder's motion was to keep was to keep the funding allocation set at 45000 but it sounds like that was kind of what the um, committee had agreed on not increasing at this time and so it sounds like if that's the case then my question's been answered okay uh mr morris i, I just want to share a timing question as you're asking these logistics the request for 
county and city staff to return to both legislative bodies in March is because that's intentionally before the rating panels meet to review the materials and make recommendations. So if you go through a process where you do end up considering augmenting based on whatever, if you had that decision made in March, um, that is the moment we can get additional direction on multiple levels so that we can give clear instruction to the rating panels, um, sort of the size of the funding and the tiers, et cetera. So I just wanna add that to the logistical pieces that you're tracking. Thank you. Council Member Colantar Johnson. Thank you, that's really helpful, Randy. So maybe maybe we can put an item, recommendation five, um, that timeline of March, just to have some more specifics there. The maker of the motion, uh, let's see. To return back to council, council in March. With by, by March. By March, so number five, Laura. There we go. I I would also, if the maker of the motion, Councilmember Boulder is okay with it, I'd also want to just check with my colleagues on the CPC, Councilmember Brown and Watkins, if they're okay with that. Let's do thumbs up. Okay. Great. Um, okay, so we have a we have a motion on the floor uh, by uh, Councilmember Golder. Seconded by Council Member Kalantari Johnson with a um, change uh, with more specificity to zero in on this um, uh, period of March in terms of any uh, ex uh, additional funding. And um, I think we're good to go. So, Bonnie, why don't we go ahead and do a roll call vote? Council Members Watkins? Aye. Council Member Johnson? Aye. Um, Brown. Aye. Coming. Aye. Holder. Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner. Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That pa that motion passes unanimously. Thank you, um, Laura, for picking this up so quickly. Thank you, Randy, for being with us today. We got you out at 5.30. That's pretty good for us. We could we could have had you here till, gosh, 1.30 in the morning if we really wanted to. So so, so I have heard, and please get over your colds, everyone. <laughs> we will. Thank Mayor, you. Mayor, uh, I just wanted to yeah. say th thanks to Randy as well and his team. Um, they They've been working around the clock and um, getting this RFP into tip top shape. And it's it's been a huge consolidated effort over at the county. So it's just been impressive to work with them. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank Randy and the team over at the county for all their help. Thank you. And I wanna thank the, um, the council members who sit on our community programs committee. I know many of you have been on Definitely. that for a while and your uh, guidance and leadership has really, I think, just continues to refine this program and do a really meaningful, impactful program for our community. So thanks for your work. Okay, council, you. Um, you have earned yourself a, um, basically, why don't we take, um, why don't we go ahead and take a, uh, we'll start back up at six o'clock. So go ahead and get a break, run around the block, We'll come back at six. We've got one more item, which is the item number 32, the city financial status update. And then we do have oral communications and we will have to go back into closed session after oral communications. So we'll see you back here at six o'clock. Thanks everyone. Okay. If council members can turn on their cameras. Looks like we're got a quorum to start back up again. For members of the public, uh, we are uh, starting up again tonight. Uh, we are on item number 32, which is the city financial status update. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wanna comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. 
The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. I'll go ahead and turn this over to Lupita Alamos, our budget manager. Welcome, Lupita. And Bobby is here as well, Bobby McGee, our finance director. So I'm not sure exactly who will be doing it, but uh, I'll turn it over to our finance staff. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Mayor Myers and uh, members of the council. Good evening. Um, I'll be handling the presentation tonight, although um, the city's budget manager is here, um, if there are questions of her as well. Um, so uh, let me share my screen here and bring the presentation up. And while that's coming up, I'll um, just take a moment to uh, to recognize the entire finance team who contributed to uh, this report. As you can imagine, <laughs> a large number of people to put all the data together that goes into the staff report as well as the presentation. So I just want to say thank you to the finance team who is here tonight uh, and available for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so tonight uh, on our agenda, we want to talk a little bit about the purpose and background of why we're here tonight. Um, provide the council with a fiscal update, some uh, revenues to date, what we're looking at as far as the recovery um, and impacts on the horizon. And the next steps, planning ahead um, for what we might be looking at uh, in the future. All right, yeah, are you able to see Bobby, me? We, yeah. we're not seeing, we don't see we're your not seeing um, presentation, Bobby. All right, let's try that again. Okay, let me stop the share. Okay. Are you yeah, able to see, see it, it now? Yeah, it's not in full screen view, but we can definitely see it. How about now? Is that working? It is, yep. My, my apologies to the council. I thought I had that worked out. Okay, as I had mentioned on the agenda tonight, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the purpose and background of why we're here, um, provide the council with an update on revenues and uh, expenses, um, impacts that we see on the horizon and ultimately uh, planning ahead and what the next steps are. So the purpose tonight is to give the council an update on the city's financial status. Um, and lay the foundation for next year's budget for both uh, operating and the capital investment program. And then start conversations on the long range financial planning uh, for the city. Uh, as for background's sake, um, as the council knows, the city has been experiencing an ongoing structural financial deficit, which has required some budget solutions in recent years. And uh, we expect that that will continue uh, into the future absent any future budget solutions. And we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, the impacts from COVID-19 and the uh, of revenue losses and economic impacts of, of that, as well as the CZU uh, lightning complex fire uh, really contributed to um, a lot of revenue losses for the city and a reliance on reserves uh, in, the, in the past budgets. And, uh, the employees certainly did their part in, in contributing through um, uh, furloughs and, uh, and a hiring freeze, which was put in place. And through the council's actions, um, there was a journey to economic recovery through the re-envision Santa Cruz program, the establishment of an ad hoc revenue committee, and uh, through the acceptance of uh, ARPA funding, um, which is one-time only funding um, designed to assist with previous revenue losses that were um, created as a result of the economic crisis. And so as the council likely remembers, at the time of the budget hearings and budget adoption last year, um, businesses and travel were still under restrictions due to COVID-19 impacts. And, and that really uh, impacted the revenue sources um, especially the transient occupancy tax as people um, were just not visiting Santa Cruz nearly as much. And the economic recovery at that time was very uncertain. We didn't know how long we were going to be in this. And so um, we adopted uh, 
the budget uh, with some very conservative revenue recovery projections at that time. And highlights of that, it was a mostly status quo budget with uh, one-time cuts having been restored. However, we did lift the hiring freeze and, and there were no furloughs considered in this year's budget. Um, there were no budget reductions in this year's budget other than those that were resulting from one-time expenses projects and operational efficiencies. And a very modest amount of $2 million in overall CIP general fund money was budgeted for um, the highest priority uh, projects. And so moving into a fiscal update, as we start to look at the recovery um, and how things are going, it's actually recovering a little bit faster on the revenue side than we had originally projected. And so I'll draw your attention to the green bar up there on the sales tax uh, line, which is the first quarter uh, sales tax receipts um, that ended as of uh, September 30th, 2021. And as you can see, there's been a pretty significant recovery in the sales tax area. This is due primarily to um, some additional online tax, the Wayfair decision and those types of things that um, in the past we did not see. And so we expected to see a stronger recovery in the sales tax area this year, not quite as strong as this. Um, so it's actually a little bit of good news there. Um, the other ones to, to highlight some of the revenue recovery as, as we move out of the COVID pandemic, um, if you'll notice the transient occupancy tax uh, as you can see, as we were in, in deep into the COVID times, the orange bar, this, the transient occupancy tax was significantly lower. And you can see there's been a fairly strong recovery in that area as compared to uh, not only the COVID year, um, but is uh, compared to the 2019 uh, first quarter fiscal um, year also. And then fees and charges. And that uh, line has gone up quite a bit as well as compared to um, the orange bar, which is the, the COVID period. And that's due primarily to um, the increase in development fees, parks and rec fees, some planning permits, and, and things like that, that, that intuitively lets us know that the recovery is uh, in full force at this time. And I will caution that we should not look at these numbers and and expect that uh, we multiply this by four and that's where the revenue ends up because these uh, items are cyclical in nature and so this is what the first quarter looks like and we'll have a little better understanding of what overall uh, revenues will look like for the year when we come back with the mid-year report. And so while we looked at uh, revenues, we also looked at the first quarter general fund expenditures. Um, the first quarter general fund expenditures citywide are about 19% to date, which is what we would typically expect in any given year. Um, that's due primarily to uh, projects that are slated to start later this fiscal year or projects that are already in process but have not been completed and completely paid for yet. So across the board, each budget we have looked at and we are trending to stay within budget appropriations at this time. However, uh, I will note that uh, additional budget appropriations will be required as new council directed programs and services began. And so when we looked at our revenues and our revenue recovery plus our uh, expenditures, we started to develop some budget scenarios that we could look out into the future and, and try to project uh, what this budget will look like from a multi-year basis. And so this, this um, graph here on the left, um, the general fund available balance plus stabilization reserve, um, the, the blue dotted line there is the council's reserve goal of 16.67%, which is very much in line with GFOA best practices. And as you can see on this graph here, um, the red line is is actuals in the past and what we're forecasting into the future. And we plug in a certain amount of assumptions into the model, which um, develops these projections. And so the assumptions on our base case scenario include no cost increases for any new services or programs or personnel. It also includes revenues continue over at the current pace and the current rate. And this particular graph was uh, exclusive of any ARPA funding, which we know we are going to receive the ARPA funding. And so when we look at this, as you'll note, um, in fiscal years 21, 22, 
uh, 23 and 24, we are slightly below the council's reserve goal. And in 24, 25, we uh, would hit the reserve goal and then start trending above that um, starting in fiscal year 26. And then in scenario B, we um, took the same set of assumptions and then we added in the ARPA funding, which we know we will receive. And once again, this ARPA funding is one time only money. Um, it is not theoretically available for ongoing services or programs. And um, when we factor that amount in, you can see the reserve goal actually exceeds the 16.67% uh, the immediately and absent of any future um, increases in expenditures, that type of thing, you'll, you'll see that the uh, reserve grows pretty healthy um, up into uh, to the fiscal year 29 and 30. And so in scenario C, you see a, quite a dramatic change in this red line here. And we essentially took the same assumptions with the ARPA funding added in and added in modest increase to operating costs to maintain current levels of service. And the assumption that we made was at the rate of uh, expected rate of inflation. In addition to that, in this particular uh, portion of the model, we added $5.5 million in new expenditures um, for homeless, uh, homelessness program expenditures. And as you will note uh, on this graph here, in fiscal year 22-23, um, you're essentially at your reserve goal. However, that starts declining very rapidly with the addition of the homelessness program expenditures. And so by the year uh, 25, 26, you essentially run out of money and you have nothing left in your reserves at that time. And as part of this overall budget forecasting program, we started looking at the unfunded CIP um, projects that are known at this time. And this is what is in the budget book at, uh, at this time. And I'll draw your attention specifically to the general fund priority one projects, which you can see is about 3.7 million of the highest priority items right now. And in addition to that, we know uh, factually that this graph is understated at this time. This is some of the most urgent needs that the city is aware of. And as part of this process, we started working with all of the departments on identifying um, multi-year CIP uh, projects that we know will be out on the horizon to try to get a much more accurate understanding of what unfunded CIP needs are, not only in the immediate future, but the long-term future. So we would expect that this graph is understated here, and I wouldn't want to speculate what that number might look like once we finish this process, but I can tell you it will be larger than this. And so we factored in to scenario D um, the ARPA funding, which was there, we left in the $5.5 million in new expenditure appropriations for the homeless and services program. And then we added in $5 million in new expenditure appropriations for the CIP program. And once again, modest growth in expenditures uh, at the rate of inflation is all we uh, anticipated there. And as you can see on this graph here, you essentially run out of money in fiscal year 23-24. The reserves are completely depleted in, in this uh, scenario. Um, all of the one-time money is completely spent and there are uh, no, there's no ability at this time for the city to maintain its levels of um, current levels of service. And so that's about $12 million in, in that last scenario there. And so when we started thinking about what does a $12 million budget solution look like in, in terms of cuts, and so hypothetically, that would essentially mean the complete elimination um, of your administrative services functions citywide. That would mean no more finance department, which would include payroll and accounts payable, paying vendors um, and receiving revenue. You would have to completely eliminate the human resources department, meaning hiring people, administration of benefits, and information technology, which means no more computers, no more computer programs, no more email, those types of things. And, and obviously reductions of that magnitude are just simply not possible. And so planning ahead, we started thinking about what are the things we need to do in order to ensure the fiscal sustainability of the city. 
And so staff will continue to work with the uh, council ad hoc revenue committee to explore any new potential revenue sources, anything we can think of. Um, any proposed new programs and services must absolutely be developed and evaluated with budget estimates and a careful, thoughtful, methodical approach applied to whether we have the money to do these types of things or not. We will be working on, um, on coming up with recommendations for the operational budget as well as the CIP plan, um, not only for fiscal year 23, but also a long range financial plan for the city, which would include strategies for dealing with some of these uh, capital, uh, capital needs, known capital needs. And so with that, I will say um, thank you, really appreciate your time and uh, let the council know that uh, staff is available for any questions. And um, I will uh, also mention that the budget team is here tonight as well. So um, if we need any additional support, um, we've got several members of the finance team that are here to answer your questions tonight. Thank you, um, Director uh, McGee. Um, and just a reminder um, tonight, uh, this really is an update item um, in terms of um, any action, um, but mostly just uh, really getting this important update as we move through our fiscal year. Are there questions or comments from council? Uh, council Member Watkins. Yeah, thank you for the presentation and overview. And I had a chance to review the agenda report and Rosemary, I apologize, we weren't able to connect beforehand. Um, my question is in regards to the um, federal infrastructure bill that was passed recently and what that could have in terms of implications on our budget projections for some of our CIP needs. Yeah, those are not uh, known at this time. I don't have any insight as to what the city might be receiving, um, but obviously as soon as uh, I hear anything, we'll be happy to share that with the council. Um, can I add a couple of things on this? Um, I, I, a couple of uh, things are worth talking about is just in general. One is that often uh, when you get a big chunk of money like this coming in, um, you know, whether they're competitive or grants or even allocations, the work ends up, uh, the money ends up getting spent on stuff that's, um, you've heard it described as shovel ready. And um, while that makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons, if your projects are in very uh, early stage of development, sometimes you can't get them shovel ready to in time to be um, in time to be competitive. One of the things I would say regarding this, in terms of where the water department is, and we talked about this when we talked about the financial plan for the water department in September, is that because of the three four years of work we've been doing on developing projects we're a lot more ready to go after some of this money that's coming down. And that's a good thing because doing so will help mitigate some of the rate impacts that you know are, are associated with funding that. And I'm sure we do have some things that are more ready to go than other things. So it's a matter of trying to look around and see what's coming and what matches up with uh, what is gonna be available. So that information is just beginning to get out now. Uh, Council, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner and then Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Thank you, Bobby McGee, for that presentation. It was um, very helpful to see where we're at and those projections and assumptions. Um, um, and really, it, it to me, what I see is, is a clearer picture of what our goal is and um, where our gap is. And um, as the revenue committee moves forward, understanding what exactly some of those assumptions are that need to be um, worked towards. And um, I know my question is, um, it's, this is a scenario, these assumptions given nothing else changes. And we know that many things will be changing, including, um, for example, with some of the homelessness services, the 5.5 million that is projected. Um, I think I, I would imagine that other costs related to that would come off and come down. And I don't know 
that, that comparison of how significant that would be. Um, and even just a, as a most recent example in um, our oversized vehicle um, ordinance research, some of the costs cleaning out the storm drain, for example, and I don't know if that's a good example, but there were significant costs with certain um, um, items related to that. And so um, just if you have any idea or if that has been looked into at all, um, some of the costs that would go away with some of these other items coming on programs and direction. Yeah, thank you. Um, appreciate the question. And, and I'll say that when we build these budget models, we take what is known at this time. And so, so uh, there's a lot of unknowns that um, we could reasonably expect in the future uh, that are not essentially built into this model. So the way we typically deal with these things is take what your known costs are at this time, and, and then we don't speculate on what the council may or may not uh, approve or, or direct staff to do in the future. And so we just add an as assumed rate of inflation to what we do know today, and that's really how we build the models. If you wanted us to build something else into it, other assumptions, then we certainly could. And the reason we built in these two particular assumptions, such as the homelessness service program, and, CIP, and uh, unfunded CIP needs is those are known um, to previous directions by the council that uh, that we felt was appropriate to build into this model. Right, um, and I guess that's why I was wondering if it, if there were any there was any further dive into those specific scenarios of what what costs would go away based on the direction. Yeah, um, no, or not at, at this, this time point yet. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, not at this time yet. Not at this time. Yes, correct. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the information. Councilmember Pontari Johnson. Thank you. I think I think you may have uh, responded to my question, uh, but it's it's connected to what Councilmember Watkins brought up about the infrastructure bill that just passed and how that would impact. Uh, I know that our city is also working with uh, a grant firm, and um, I imagine that we'll have some grant opportunities coming our way. So it, it seems like what I what I think I heard you say is that since those are real unknowns, it's hard to create scenarios with that in the in mind. Is that yeah? Yeah, that's absolutely accurate. Now we could certainly do some modeling and make some basic assumptions, but at this time it's it's really just a guess. And so we try not to guess. We try to give you as, as accurate of a picture as we know, um, irrespective of what we think may happen in the future. Okay. And I think just, just a comment that this is, I mean, it was clear before, but this has made it very clear that, uh, well, the, the, the revenue subcommittee has a lot of work to do, but that we need to keep all options on the table and all of us as council members just being... Um, very thoughtful about how we make those decisions because this is, it, it's very real when you see it in those graphs. So I appreciate all the work that you've done and thank you for uh, presenting us with a, with a stark but real picture. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Council member Cummings and then council member Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, having gone through budgets now three times and been on the budget committee three years, I mean, this is pretty concerning. And for me, has been part of the reason why I've been hesitant to um, move forward with approving a number of these services that where we didn't know the costs for implementation and where the funds are going to come from. Because, I mean, this projection, <clears throat> I think, also is a little bit conservative because in the, the general report, it said it's between 5.5 million and 7 million. So this is, you know, you know, if we include in the CIP, it's more like 12 million to 14 million dollar deficit that we'll be looking at. Um, and that's you know, that's really concerning. Given the given the, you know what would be eliminated as a result um, moving forward, uh, I have a couple questions. Um, actually, uh, at this time, I think I mostly just wanted to make those comments. Um, yeah, I'm just really concerned. So I I guess moving forward, given that the council is given direction. You know, what are options um, in terms of whether or not um, we can keep going down this route or um, because, I mean, it seems like we've committed to 
moving forward and spending this money, but there's, there's a huge, you know, there's a, a really big cliff we're about to fall off if we keep going in this direction, and there's no guarantee a revenue measure will pass. Um, and, you know, we're as we're coming out of this, this recession or the uh, pandemic recession, you know, there's a lot of concern about how we're going to be able to move forward. So I'm just curious about, you know, what are our options in terms of keeping us from going into this financial crisis? Sure. And if we, and thank you for the question, if we were to continue down this road, obviously we would have to find some type of budget solution in order to maintain this level of spending. And that's kind of why we highlighted that, um, as you mentioned, one option would be to find uh, some additional revenue that would support these ongoing programs, ongoing revenue to support the ongoing programs. But the funding that we have available right now is one-time only revenue, and we're talking about ongoing programs. And so that's why we wanted to highlight that as a matter of budget solutions, um, if, if we were to look at cuts, I mean, that's essentially what $12 million looks like, is it, it cuts out your entire administrative services function um, as a budget solution to, to, to fund some of these other programs. Rosemary, did you have a response? Uh, I just wanted to add that um, I think as the staff has really worked on the the CSSO implementation work and and to some degree started to integrate the things that are in the um, in the oversized vehicle ordinance, it where the costs associated with those uh, programs are is in the programs and services that are being provided and. You know, we're kind of, I would say, between a rock and a hard place with respect to, you know, whether we do the ordinance and the, that part of that um, of the uh, the equation. Uh, there's been a lot of support in the community for the kinds of services that are being laid out through the, you know, through the implementation of these these uh, ordinances, and it feels to me as though we're facing some version of that one way or another, whether it's five and a half million or whether it's a number that's lower or it's a number that that's higher is, you know, it's not irrelevant, but it just feels to me as though the major sort of change that's occurred in the last year is that the city is stepping up to making a pace and even more significant because we've absorbed costs into our budgets, right? But even more significant um, commitment to providing services for people experiencing homelessness. So I guess what's the, uh, is there a timeline for when the council will hear back about uh, the revenue measure? I know in the previous revenue committee, uh, we did some polling about, you know, how the funding should be spent. And it seemed like, you know, when we were trying to put together a strat an outreach strategy, there was, you know, a number of different things that the funding would go towards not just solely homelessness. And so I'm wondering if, um, you know, if there's going to be a poll that goes out where we can kind of get a sense of where the community is at. And then I guess also our options with, if it's a quarter cent sales tax and what revenue that will bring in, TOT, what revenue that will bring in, just so we can get a sense of, you know, regardless of what tax measures we bring forward, are we going to meet these goals of kind of um, closing that gap? Yeah. Yeah, Councilmember Cummings. Um, certainly, we will be looking at those types of things as we move forward. And and, and just for clarity's sake, when we're discussing the model and and what types of revenue um, we need to find, um, to your comment about the the homelessness program, um, we built in 5.5 million into the model. And I know that the staff report shows a little bit different number because that includes about 1.5 million dollars in the one-time cost for for the startup of that program. But yes. As we move forward, uh, as part of the revenue committee, we will certainly be looking at um, you know every aspect of these things and what it takes and how do we get there and, and what our best recommendations would be to the council for trying to achieve those goals. And then I would I would add that the timeline for a revenue measure going on to the June ballot is uh, early March, so that's. One of the reasons for doing this work now and getting the revenue subcommittee going now, <coughs> so that if we do think that we want to put something onto the ballot, uh, the June ballot, we have an opportunity to get that organized. And so the things that have happened historically in a revenue subcommittee will happen again.
again, and that's the kind of timeline we're talking about, at least for the, the June ballot. And then there's that early August uh, timeline for the November ballot. Thank you. Well, yeah, I'll just express some pretty concern and I think um, we're all probably a bit concerned about where this is headed. So thank you for the presentation and um, I'll just leave my comments there. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins and then Councilmember Boulder and then I'll queue myself up. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, um, yeah, I think, I mean, I guess I'll just say, I think we all share a concern around the budget projection. <laughs> um, I think we have a different financial picture had we had a chance to let the voters weigh in on the sales tax measure that wasn't brought forward by the previous revenue committee. Um, and so I think it's important for us to be aware of what is feasible in terms of moving forward. Um, just to clarify, my, you know, I agree with what you said, Rosemary, in that I think there are opportunity costs associated with um, any kind of decision we make. But my understanding is that the consensus of this council was to lead with programming, especially as addressing homelessness. And I, I share that belief. And if that's not um, consistent um, with with what I think other council members feel, I, I you know I'd like clarity on that because I think that's something I've heard even from council members who have voted no, um, that leading with services is the response we want to have, and that does cost money, but it costs money either way, and we want to have more, um, you know, we want to have pathways for success. So I guess you know my my question is in terms of uh, polling, absolutely. In terms of a re revenue committee, absolutely in terms of increasing our revenue uh, sources, uh, absolutely necessary to get us out of this fiscal predicament that we're in. And feasibly, if we aren't able to get full consensus from the council to do a sales tax measure, which was by uh, polling standards, pretty supported by the, by the community, and then when could we bring something like that forward? I guess is my kind of, maybe it's a question for legal, but um, if we don't get full consensus, to declare a fiscal emergency, which clearly we have, um, then what? when can we bring a sales tax measure forward? Maybe Tony, you can answer that question. You can bring a tax measure forward at a regular city council or at, a, at an election that coincides with the city council election without declaring a fiscal emergency. November, so November. So November of 22. Okay, okay, that's just something to keep in mind, I guess, as the revenue committee begins their work. Right. Thanks. Councilmember Golder. Thank you. I would agree with um, what Councilmember Watkins said before me. And I would also just um, like to remind my colleagues and the community the amount of money that we have been spending on doing what we've been doing as a city for the past decade or more. If we think about the costs that we've spent hundreds of thousands for cleaning up encampments, after we clean up the encampments, we've been doing restoration work, right? There's been fires, the cost of um, mutual aid, bringing in the, you know, fires from other uh, fire departments from other jurisdictions to, to, to um, battle bulls. We've had um, crimes that have to be prosecuted um, just yesterday, my 10 year old niece was biking home from school and was bike jacked by a grown man. And guess what? The bike was found down by the levee and the, the, um, the man was arrested. And so what are the costs associated with that? And so my hope is that with these services in place, with our camping ordinance and our oversized vehicle ordinance and trying to move in the direction of focusing on getting people back on track. And I'm sorry, sometimes people are unwilling to get themselves back on track without a little bit of push. So if we're working as a council and as a community to get people back on track, and we're offering that compassion to bring these members of our community back into society, reintegrating them, if you will, then my hope is that over time, those costs that we're spending um, now would go down. And so I think with bringing forward a revenue measure, with it exploring maybe um, a percent or two of TOT tax, maybe, you know, getting creative with other ways of increasing the budget, encouraging, you know, businesses and other development um, in other areas to get um, business in town, 
that it won't look so bleak. And if we constantly look just like doom and gloom, then obviously nothing is going to happen. But we can't we can't just wash our hands and be like, oh, this is horrible. We can't go on. So I'm in complete support of everything we've been doing. And I really thank you for this update. And it just motivates me more to try and move forward with the course of action that we're doing. Thank Thanks, Council Member. Um, I'll cue myself up here real quick, and then Sandy or Councilman Brown, I'll, I'll have you come next. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I kind of share some of my colleagues' comments, um, current current comments, um, and then I also just reflect upon um, sort of conversations in the community that I've had, um, especially with the business community, and specifically with um, actually our um, you know our hotels. Um, they're in a very competitive um, place right now, and um, many of the those owners um, are really struggling with the condition of our city. And the condition of our city is largely related to some of the um, the conditions that we see, unfortunately, with the way that we're managing or not managing homelessness. We have not been really managing homelessness at all. Um, we've been convincing ourselves that you know letting people kind of you know unfortunately live the way that they are living is is okay um and it's really not borne out very well in terms of how it's you know the levels of of what's happening now in the community and um you know the polling we did for the sales tax measure last um spring really showed very strong support um it was in fact homelessness ranked i think as the highest um community concern and willingness to um to you know, get us to step up and try to start managing it, um, provide services, figure out ways to stabilize folks um, to the extent that they can then get into case management and, and other things. Um, I think also I've uh, watched a lot in the philanthropy world of our county. Um, you know, and hats off to Housing Matters. You know, they just raised 9.5 million dollars for their permanent supportive housing project. That's a signal that our community is willing to help philanthropically as well as potentially through tax measures or other sources of funds to tackle the issue. Um, homelessness has a huge impact on our economy. It has a huge impact on our local businesses. Um, it's impacting local families now. Um, and I'm not to say that, you know, homeless people are, are out there running around, you know, stealing kids' bikes, but it, it is a massive impact. And, um, you know, you talk to the hospitality industry, um, you know, they see those impacts. They're they're competing against places that don't have the severity of what we have. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's incumbent that we we actually acknowledge um, this massive social policy issue we have, and we start to work towards it. Um, I'd also like to note that there's you know 1.2 billion dollars that's going to hit the street from the city of San from the state of California. And you know, a similar investment, not quite that big from the feds. So um, again, a lot of this is about getting ready. A lot of this is about um, looking like you actually are taking management and you're you you have the humanitarian um, perspective that um, you need to start to lean in and and, and work with the issues. So um, uh, you know, I I think we can sustain these costs. We have to be. Um, very thoughtful and programmatic about it. We will use, I'm sure, some of the 14 point, the 14 million that we have to do some of these startup investments. Um, but doing nothing again is not helping anybody, and it's definitely not helping our local businesses. Um, and there is there is plenty of costs that we haven't included, including response times. Um, you know, if we do have a major wildfire, there will be additional costs, <laughs> significant costs. So. Um, to me, the homeless question really comes down to a risk management um, question around um, financial investment in some some um, social service um, programmatic outcomes that we do for hopefully not forever, but we make an investment and we try to, to um, remedy the trend. We've seen plenty of communities that have done this and um, unfortunately the state is not helping and we're going to have to start solving some of the issues ourselves. So. Um, I do think these are good investments. It's what our community, I believe, wants. And um, and hopefully we can get a revenue measure together that we can uh, get on uh, the ballot and let's let our voters um, tell us what they want to be, you know, helping us uh, do as 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 policy leaders. So um, 
I'll uh, go ahead and call on Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. I um, I feel the need to make a comment here. I was going to save this time for questions, but because we've moved into the comment and um, or commentary portion, I feel the need to um, just say a couple of things. Um, first, I am beyond thrilled that um, I am hearing this um, indication of support and commitment from council members and that our staff has kind of stepped up and is presenting us with um, some some real data on the potential costs for providing services to support our unhoused community members in, in ways that will, I, I think, um, be more effective than the enforcement only no management approach that the city has utilized for the past 30 years plus, as far as I can tell. Um, and it's really obviously getting, um, you know, getting the, the pressures are increasing. We know that. So I'm like, this is what I've been advocating since my first day on the council. And I'm like really thrilled that five years later, here we are. And um, that's, um, there's some real possibility here. Um, and then with respect to the question around uh, revenue measures, um, given that I was the person, you know, I'm, I will say it here, I was the council member who withheld my vote on a sales tax, a fiscal emergency for a sales tax um, the last time around. Um, and I was not able to really communicate with the Revenue Committee due to Brown Act uh, issues. Um, I'd like to say it here that um, under those circumstances, I um, and primarily based upon communications with our previous city manager, because that was my conduit for um, having conversations about what the intentions were. Um, I did not have the sense that this was the priority. Um, I had a sense that generally, yeah, this is what the, it pulled well, and this is what we care about, but I, I did not get that sense. And um, so, you know, that's a real difference. I see that as a difference. And, um, and so I just wanted to say that here now, because I won't be able to weigh in um, given that I'm not on the um, revenue committee this time either. Um, but I but I do think it's important to be clear while I have the opportunity and not violating the Brown Act to say um, that my support for something like that really depends upon um, my level of confidence in the funding being spent on the most critical needs um, that we have in our community. And you know, I'm not going to do an autopsy on the discussions that um, were had in the previous round, um, but I do hope that um, the Revenue Committee will consider, in addition to pulling for a sales tax, other revenue measures. I just um, gleefully filled out my um, poll. I'm one of the people who was polled from by the county about an empty home tax and um, also about the potential for a TOT and increase. And um, those were not questions that the city uh, council uh, or the revenue committee saw fit to ask in the last round. And I really hope that you might consider that um, as part of your, your discussions, because I think there are opportunities for um, increasing revenues in, in ways that will not have um, a significant impact on, you know, again, our, you know, working class and, and marginalized people in our community. So um, I think I'll leave it there. Um, but but I, I, re I really do just want to stress, um, you know, that, you know, I'm willing to be a participant in this conversation. And, um, I, I, but I, I do want to see um, us, you know, really put our, our money where our mouth, <laughs> mouths are um, with respect to, to where we spend that funding, where we, what we prioritize. So um, thanks for letting me jump in with that. And um, I'll, I'll leave it there for this round. Thank you, council member. Are there any other questions or comments? <laughs> Vice Mayor Bruner's cats ready to call it a night. Um, from council members at this point, or any other questions for our finance director or our finance staff? Um, looks like we're 
We're good. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a really sobering report. Um, um, and I think uh, I'm curious, um, do you, when you're projecting these trends, um, I was curious also about, um, I didn't see in the, in the red line, kind of in the scenario two, um, you know, typically we, we kind of have these eight year, sort of seven to eight year recession periods, um, Bobby, and I'm just curious, I've seen other financial charts, you know, where, you know, there's this, there's a, you know, there is a trough that gets hit. And I, I didn't see between the no ARPA and the ARPA where we, you know, have this very, you know, positive red line that's going, you know, do we really think that that is possible or do we see that, you know, dip, you know, that we know as our typical recessionary kind of cycle that California goes through pretty, pretty regularly. I'm just curious about your comment on that. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I can tell you that the spreadsheets that are behind these graphs that you see here are very complex and detailed. And yes, we do build an expected recessionary impact in every seven years. So that is reflected in the graphs that you saw tonight. There's a tremendous amount of factors that, that go into this, but certainly that was one of them. And so, you know, when we when I think about what we've lost in 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 due to the COVID-19, you know, um, catastrophe, you know, we dipped into our reserves and it looks like a two month of our reserves is, I don't know what it is exactly, but it, I just did some rough map, math. It looks like, you know, that's about 18 million. So, you know, we, if, if, you, if you're assuming two months, you want to keep that in the bank so you can get through something. So it's it's almost like we have to we're almost building kind of double building out of that issue, right? Because we we basically have borrowed from our reserves to, to close the gap that we had through the COVID issue, um, but that we want to fill that back up, and then we also want to get back to that two, to the additional two months. So it's you know I mean we're we're sort of digging out of a of a four month issue, which is a significant amount of money, and that's why that 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 red line goes up, but then eventually we, we get that, we get, we've refilled the piggy bank and then we're just back on track with proper reserve, um, proper reserve practices. Is that, is that an easy, is that a way to kind of describe what, what we see in these charts? Yeah, certainly. Uh, obviously the reason we put that um, blue line up there, which is the reserve goal is that is the council's uh, policy that, that has been directed to staff. And I know that that recommendation was previously made on um, GFOA best practices and, and recommended reserve levels um, for contingency funds for anything that may come up if in the event of an emergency, a catastrophic event, whatever. Um, so that would certainly be an appropriate uh, uh, strategy to take is exactly what you're suggesting there. Okay. And that, that 21 million we lost really you know, I mean, that's that's significant because unlike a lot of communities, the ARPA is not ever going to make us whole. We're never going to, we're always going to lose about that $7 million, which, you know, is then compounded by the borrowing against ourselves. So, okay, great. Thank you. Council yeah, I, I, yeah I'm, 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 sorry. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just, just want to highlight that that ARPA money is one-time only funds that was against previous revenue losses. So it's not like it's extra money that showed up. This is actually helping fill the pot back up that was lost due to COVID. So um, so to your point, that is that is absolutely correct. This is really one-time only money. Great, thank you. Council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. I had um, one question you mentioned with, re with regards to the sales tax, tax that there was or the, sorry, the sales tax revenue increased that that was a result of a specific act. And I couldn't, um, I couldn't make that out. And I was just curious if you could speak a little bit about that. And it was related to online sales. I think it would just be helpful for the community to understand how that, um, that retail uh, has helped in this, how this act has helped us. Sure. Um, that was actually called the Wayfair decision where um, uh, we started collecting sales tax on online sales, which had not been previously done in the past. And so uh, one of the things that we experienced, which was a little unexpected as we went into COVID, is, is when you look at sales tax by sector, one of the things that we saw was a decrease in, in many of the sectors that you would expect, such as um, the purchase of automobiles, the purchase of, of fuel, things like that. However, 
what we saw was that while the residents here in uh, the city of Santa Cruz um, were not spending money on those types of things, they did continue to spend money. They just did a lot of online purchases. And so the uh, the county pool increased dramatically. The money that comes through the county pool as a result of the Wayfair decision um, increased dramatically. And so I think that uh, the, the sales tax graph that I showed you tonight is, is very reflective of that. Great, and just for, for clarification for the public, it's, it's like if individuals at home are buying items online, regardless of where they are, not necessarily buying them here from businesses here in Santa Cruz, but um, businesses from afar as well, and that helps increase our sales tax revenue. That is correct, yes. Great. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear because this is something new, and I think it's you know, going to be worth us tracking and trying to better understand as we're kind of shifting away from your brick-and-mortar retail and kind of moving into the space where so many other people are buying things online and, and how that will help, you know, when it comes to our sales tax revenue. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I know that uh, the Revenue Committee will be starting up work this next week, and um, I believe that we'll be building our budget over the next several months. So thank you for this peek into the future. Um, pretty intimidating, but hopefully we'll get creative and um, pull everything back together. So thank you for your work, and thanks for this early update. It's really helpful. Anything else on this, Rosemary? Um, do you want to see if there's any public comment? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I will do that. Okay. Uh, if you are interested in speaking to us on agenda item number 32, which is the city financial status update, I'd like you to please um, go ahead and raise your hand by pressing star nine. And um, I see we had a hand up and it just disappeared. If you are interested in um, uh, addressing the council on this item, which is uh, item number 32, city financial status update, um, if you could raise your hand by pressing star nine now and I'll call on you and you can speak with the council. I am not seeing any hands up. So we'll go ahead and bring this back to council. Um, again, this is just to receive an update um, and we don't, aren't, um, anticipate to take any deliberation or action past that, correct? Right. Okay. Thank you very much again for all the work. Okay, um, next up we have oral communications for members of the public who are streaming this meeting. If you wanna comment on oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on the phone, excuse me, on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture it in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required that you state your name. Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been completed. So for again, uh, please go ahead and press star nine if you'd like to speak to us tonight in oral communications, and this will be for items not on the agenda. I see phone number ending in 8469. Please go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself and um, we'll be able to hear from you. So press star six if you can, that should- Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Thank you. My name is Mike Rotkin. I'm a citizen in the city of Santa Cruz. I wanna comment on a uh, response to a comment you got on two of your earlier items, but not on the items themselves, which would not be appropriate for oral communication. What you got was a rant from somebody who obviously has the free speech right to say whatever he wants about whatever, you know, on an item. But his assumption was that there's somehow a level playing field in the legal frame of how uh, people respond to the possibilities of uh, advancement in all kinds of areas. And his view was that given that there's a level playing field, any type of attempt to sort of regulate or support or provide, break down barriers that stop people 
uh, of different ethnicities or genders from participating in the public process, there's an outrageous attack on white people. And if you were appropriate to like let him have his rant, but I think it's worth responding that his, his rant is not based on any factual information. The reality is there's, there's uh, massive evidence that there are barriers uh, to entry into all kinds of uh, fields that are based on not, not just historical barriers, like slavery, for example, but current ongoing barriers that stop people from equal participation in the public process. And you can demonstrate that without any difficulty that there are disparities in wealth, income, education, health care, housing, public safety, access to elected office, corporate positions, top governmental positions, on and on and on. And so when people make, uh, make these kinds of comments that somehow, you know, if we just didn't do anything, just let stuff go the way it is and treat everybody the same and ignore that there might be differences in access or barriers to people's access, it really is misunderstanding the reality of the situation that we're in. So I just wanted to call in and respond to that. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that people have these rants. It is a racist rant in the sense, I don't just throw the word around loosely, it's a racist rant in the sense that it doesn't base itself on current reality or what's actually going on. So uh, my view is uh, I, just, I, I just wanted to respond to that and not leave that those comments left without a response. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have uh, phone number ending in 1810. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett. Hey, I don't expect leftists to agree with me. That's okay. Anyway, in this country, we have a principle known as innocent until proven guilty. In the stricken item number 27, you had intended to use the government loudspeaker to publicly take sides judging racism, guilt, hate, and penalties before and while our system of justice played out, which shows you intended no respect for how our system of justice works, who decides guilt and judgment, jury fact-finding, and we're a meddling party since it is city property. It was therefore not appropriate that the city council stand in solidarity with the Arts Commission and the Santa Cruz Equity Collaborative in response to the BLM billboard vandalism and their conviction of hate actions of the alleged perpetrators prior to the conclusion of the case, as that is too much like Maxine Waters to me. The support documents have been up for the last five days, which I still consider an ethics violation by publicly sh showing support for plaintiffs, proclaiming hate crime guilt, and proposing restitution while the trial was still in session in print by posting such on the council agenda website. I assume you don't care what facts a jury finds or what the judge's penalties are. Your giddy prejudice shows. The agenda discussion item was stricken Monday, but not the accusatory print supporting documents. Discussion was stricken, I assume, for the reasons I pointed out to you in my letter, which I believe was deleted at the same time. None of that should ever have been seen on a city website during a trial or still left up. Whether the vandalism is or is not a hate crime and with what guilt or penalties will be decided by the criminal justice system, not by you, not Abia Mustafa, not Santa Cruz Equity Collab. The BLM stencil billboard is not an original idea, not art, not even a mural. It is merely property consisting of stenciled paint letters and is the name of a national violent Marxist anarchist organization that has caused a mega national violence. I say approving a permanent easement created a glorification symbol of mob violence of a group many consider the poster of domestic terror. Your prejudice doesn't recognize that this vandalism can possibly be just a youngster's doing tire burnout vandalism, or it could be no different than protesters committing vandalism against statuary they oppose, removing a mission bell they disapprove, protest vandalism in the clock tower or the police station, or even a possible Thank protest you. against the violent arson. Thank you. Your time is up. Sander uh, Nonnenberg uh, has your hand up next, please. You press star six, we should be able to hear from you. Go ahead, please. You'll, you'll have to mute whatever device you're using um, in order for us to hear you. Otherwise, it'll be an echo. If you're watching on TV, you'll want to turn your TV down. If you're speaking to us on a phone or... Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Can you take this out of there? My name is Karen Allenberg, and I'm a um, very concerned community member and mother. I live on the Lower West Side, and my three children all bike to school almost every day of the year. I have two kids at Bayview Elementary, and I have one daughter at Mission Hill. 
Um, and yesterday, my nine-year-old, she's actually turned nine two weeks ago, so I consider her six, eight, was biking home with council member Golder's daughter, or niece, sorry, her niece, along the rail trail, which, you know, we always let our children bike on the rail trail. We live about seven blocks from school, and my daughter was three blocks from her school when a man jumped out and blocked the rail trail and robbed her and her two friends at the age of nine. And um, another mother was a few yards way behind walking her dog. This was at 3 p.m. in the afternoon on their way from school. And he grabbed the bike from um, one of the, the girls and um, got on it and he rode away after, you know, he yelled at them and said he was gonna get it. And anyway, um, they were, traumatized and they seem to be doing fine at this moment but I felt like I let them down as a mother by allowing this to happen and um, I then went with my husband and we drove around our town that we love my husband grew up here I've lived here for 20 years we both work in the community I worked for Dominican for 15 years now and we saw that when we drive a mile to the north of our house and a place to look for this person, maybe who stole and um, basically robbed our nine-year-old, that there was um, everybody camping, bikes stolen all over the place around the area a mile to the north of us. Then we drove a mile down, mile and a half maybe to the um, One last thing I can say is that I want to know, let you all know that not dealing with the issue of homelessness crime and rampant public drug use in the city is endangering our youth. And that was made abundantly clear yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a phone uh, number ending in 4879. Please press star six to unmute yourself, please. If you press star six, you should be unmuted, be able to unmute yourself. Or let's see here. Looks like they disappeared. Lowered their hand. What was that, Mike? They just lowered their hand. Okay. Okay. Uh, last um, call for oral communications this evening. We do want to address the council on items not on tonight's agenda. Please uh, go ahead and press star nine and we'll be able to take your comment. I'm not seeing any um, any additional attendees, um, and so I will bring this back to council. I do see there's two council members. Um, typically, we um, wouldn't um, uh, address questions, um, but uh, I'll go ahead and recognize these two council members: Council Member Watkins and Council Member Colin Tar Johnson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I, I, you know, I, I know we can't take action tonight, but I just want to offer my. Um, you know, my just my sympathy and empathy to the parent who had this experience happen to their child as a parent of two young daughters. Um, and as a kid who used to go biking around in town, you know, raised in the 80s and 90s, like, you know, to not, that is a very traumatic experience. And just know that I commit as a council member to, to continue to work towards solutions so that our kids are able to thrive in our community. And I wish healing for your family and I wish healing for your daughter. Um, and and her friend and I also just want to thank um, Mike Rockin for his comments as well you know we're advised not to engage when we hear different comments sometimes during public comment but um, and certainly appreciate free speech and um, it's true a lot of the information that is shared uh, often is not uh, accurate and is um, further uh, further propelling uh, white supremacy and, um, and inaccurate information and is a disservice in that way. And so, um, you know, we reframe, but I appreciate the comments that were made. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Thank you. I also wanted to uh, thank Mr. Rodkin for calling in and calling out what is inaccurate. And uh, just to note that the comment of the individual that that it's their right to call and make the comments that they make, but it is uh, confirming that racism is very real here in our community and we have to get to work immediately. So thank you, Mr. Rodkin, for your comments. 
Thank you. And um, yeah, I'll just add my comment as well um, about the young girl that experienced what she did and um, definitely commit to um, addressing some of these safety issues and concerns that our community, frankly, um, is very vocal about and um, is really asking for change. So thank you for speaking tonight. Uh, are there any other council members at this point? Council member Cummings? I also want to um, extend uh, my sympathies to the family who experienced um, that um, that tragic interaction with that individual. I've had a similar instance as a child where one guy tried to steal my bike, another guy tried to steal my shoes, and it definitely leaves a mark on those you know those individuals for a while. And so, um, I will say though, that being said, I'm really glad um, that. Our police department was able to um, apprehend that individual uh, who is no longer on the streets. And so I just want to thank um, our police department for all their hard work for being able to track down that individual, arrest them. And I hope that they're brought to justice uh, because that kind of behavior is completely unacceptable. And I think everyone uh, on this board uh, wants to try to prevent those kinds of things from happening in our community. And so I just wanted to um, express, express my sympathy and also um, express my gratitude towards the, um, the Santa Cruz Police Department for doing a great job of apprehending this individual. Thank you, council member. Okay, uh, for members of the public, um, this does bring our meeting to adjournment this evening. Um, the council will go back into a closed session at this point in time. Thank you everyone for attending this evening and we will see you, um, our next council meeting is on November 23rd. Thank you for attending. And council members, if you can stay on, we'll, we'll be going back into closed session. Thank you all. Thank you.